event. My name is Alexander Boschkovic, and um, I'm here in front of the East Central European Center at the Herman Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to today's online conference that is um, titled Collective Memory, National Identity, and European Cultural Integration, the Central and Eastern European Perspective. Um, it is our pleasure at the Institute to have uh, Charna Pishtan as a uh, Mary uh, Spadovska Kiri postdoctoral fellow here at the Institute. And uh, Charna is the one who organized this conference. And um, uh, her own research focuses on this emerging field of law and memory. And she's currently working on her project, uh, Illusions of Eternity, the Constitution as a Place of Memory and the Problem of Collective, collective Remembrance in the Western Balkans. Um, because we are a little bit late, uh, with much ado, I'll uh, pass the uh, floor to Charna, who will say a few words. Charna, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much also for the presentation. Uh, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to this online conference. Uh, I would also like to thank everybody as well as uh, our speakers for joining us here today. Uh, today, so we will really have an amazing group of, of speakers uh, who will discuss with us uh, the challenges uh, that Central and Eastern European countries are facing currently in terms of uh, memory and identity politics under two different processes. So the, the divisive rise of nationalism on the one hand and the unifying process of European cultural integration on the other hand. Uh, so before starting with uh, speakers presentations, let me only add a few words about today's format. Uh, so we will have today uh, three panels. The first one will be dedicated to law and the politics of memory and identity. Uh, the second one to Europeanization of memory and nationalism. And then uh, finally, the third one to remembering to prevent memory and genocide prevention. Uh, so <clears throat> each speaker will have uh, 15 and not more uh, than 20 minutes for the presentation. We'll give a very brief in, uh, introduction of our speakers, but if you are looking for more details, BIOS will be made available uh, in the chat section. Uh, and also we will close uh, each panel with the Q&A session. So um, uh, after each panel, we will open and then close a Q&A session. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to submit them by using the Q&A uh, feature on, on, uh, on Zoom. Or if you are uh, watching us on YouTube, please use the chat box that you can find uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, so we will really try to answer all your questions. So uh, now, we'll, now I will give the floor to Alexander Boschkovich again, who will introduce and moderate uh, the first panel. Thanks. Thank you, Charna. So um, our... Uh, today's panel's first speaker is uh, Professor Yirji Pshivan, uh, who works at Cardiff University at U in UK, and his presentation uh, is called Collective Memory and Constitutionalism, and his biography uh, will be uh, soon available on in chat, so you can check it out. So, Professor uh, Pshivan, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great privilege and great pleasure uh, to be in this uh, company of uh, old friends, most uh, revered colleagues and uh, new people from whom I'm uh, already eager to learn more. Uh, on constitutional identity and uh, um, uh, memory, memory laws. Uh, uh, however, if I may share a screen and uh, uh, I want to push for uh, one particular uh, uh, conceptualization. Uh, uh, everybody can see the constitutional imaginaries and cultural traditions. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so uh, maybe like this. It's better. Yeah. Um, so some of you might be familiar with uh, my work, and you know it's uh, it has a long evolution from legal symbolism in uh, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, uh, I inquired about uh, temporality, past and ident constitutional identities, and um, uh, asked the question about what is the symbolic rationality of law, a particular 
constitutions, but also other laws, such as uh, the uh, lustration laws, uh, such as the act of uh, um, uh, um, uh, resistance uh, uh, to communism in the uh, uh, Czech Republic. Um, and um, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, the question is how much of this uh, symbolic rationalism is actually permeating the current European politics, law, and not just center Eastern Euro uh, um, European uh, countries, but uh, Europe in general, and what is the position of center and East European countries in the European context. So uh, my take on uh, identity, memory, and constitutionalism will try to um, uh, look at cultural traditions, but also societal expectations and reinventions of memory and politics in Central Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, when we talk about this, uh, I want to emphasize one main thesis that cultural traditions, even constitutional traditions, are always reinvented and instrumentalized by post-1989 elites. Politicians are not prisoners of the past, but respond to the imaginaries and future expectations of their voters. So whenever we talk about memory and the past, it's not substance, it's always uh, selective and it's always responding or corresponding to the modernity's dictum that expectations always prevail over experiences. There is one supporting thesis in my presentation which says that, yes, cultures spontaneously evolving and legal and political cultures are latently present in the post-1989 constitutional system, but they can stabilize it, but they cannot constitute it. So whatever use of the past and identity and memory, it's not something which would be uh, affecting us and haunting us from the past. Uh, so it's interesting, uh, and one uh, initial contextualization note, that this process uh, of uh, uh, synchronization failed. Yeah, because what was happening in Europe uh, almost uh, 35 years ago uh, were processes of uh, European integration, and with the collapse of communism, there was a mantra of uh, widening is deepening, deepening is widening. And of course, it proved horribly, horribly wrong. And uh, we can see it everywhere, not just in Central Eastern Europe. Yeah, I'm, after all, I'm sitting in Cardiff and uh, I'm out of the European Union. Um, so uh, uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, memory, past and identity, clearly there is uh, a call of populism. And clearly uh, uh, populism, in my view, is uh, uh, a response to the failures of politics in Europe in the past 30 years. So it can be anti-constitutional, it can have constitutional forms. Just look at Hungarian constitutional counter-revolution of uh, uh, 2011, Poland's anti-constitutional policies. And uh, so Central East European uh, um, uh, uh, developments are not that unique and they illustrate something which is general political and societal tendency. Um, it's uh, what are the divergencies in Central and Eastern Europe uh, that are uh, related to the reimagined and reinvented past uh, uh, is, yes, nations and their cultures are always imagined. They are not substances, they are communicated by political, constitutional agencies, texts, there are texts and contexts at the same time. For instance, uh, the history of Czechoslovakia post-1989 is a fascinating example of the collapse of federal 
statehood and yes, the rise of nationalism uh, and at the same time, differentiation between Czech Republic and Slovakia, which is an interesting interplay that uh, uh, we see even today with uh, Czech Republic just uh, successfully uh, beating uh, uh, populists for the third time in a row and Slovakia going to the parliamentary elections, which threatened to be as disastrous as uh, the Hungarian elections of 2010. Uh, Gabor is uh, contesting it, uh, but and I'm really already looking forward to the discussion. Uh, and uh, it's simply, if I uh, were uh, talking here five years ago, or oh, sorry, four years ago, I would be saying, look at Slovakia, what a fascinating mobilization of civil society and uh, how they managed to push through the agenda of uh, progressive politics in presidential election and look at the horrible Czech Republic just swamped with big men of the 1989 and uh, damaging international reputation, damaging foreign policies, domestic policies um, by uh, especially President uh, Zeman. So um, yes, uh, what I want to illustrate that even close encounters of close nations such as Czech and Slovak Republic, Slovak uh, uh, constitutional politics, Czech's constitutional politics, you have fascinating changes and waves in which um, um, these countries develop. So not everything is lost. Not everything is rosy. And um, uh, this is what I mean by supplementary thesis number two, that divergencies are always re uh, related to the reinvention of the current politics. Um, few, and, and I will go very quickly because I appreciate that um, uh, uh, we want to have more time for discussion. What is the theoretical basis of my argument is that, uh, yes, uh, constitution, constitutionalism is one um, ways of society's constitution. So even legal constitutions constitute society, but they uh, societies are much more complex, much more complicated than just their political constitutions. So we always have to look at uh, politics and law in the context of societal constitutionalism, how societies constitute their identities and how they constitute their past. Why? Um, uh, because uh, sociology is more important to uh, uh, than philosophy. So uh, let's uh, say, uh, and very in a very um, uh, uh, simplifying manner, that uh, what uh, Ernst Cassirer described as symbolic forms uh, and uh, metaphorical thinking, as uh, is uh, actually described by De uh, as collective representations. So yes, talking of identity, constitutions are one of societal forms of, one specific societal form of collective representation. Uh, we have uh, recently uh, theories of uh, social imaginaries uh, have been very popular from philosophy, from Castoriadis to more sociologically informed uh, uh, ways um, uh, by Benedict Anderson and Charles Taylor. Uh, Charles Taylor is a philosopher, nevertheless, his use of modern social imaginaries is very much informed by general social theory. Returning to uh, the imaginary of popular sovereignty and the nation state, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, the picture is of uh, Václav Havel and the full um, uh, Wenceslas Square during the 1989 revolution. And clearly the nation state, despite 
all globalization and don't take it as a self-criticism of someone who always spoke beyond the nation state and uh, but uh, um, uh, the nation state is an organization of uh, modern constitutionalism constitution productive paradoxes and differences so um yes in modernity constitutions are profoundly uh, related to the nation state however uh, what european culture and part of this conference is uh, um, uh, a reflection on european cultural identity and evolution of european culture what europe teaches us and europe the history of european integration is that this polity and this imaginary of topos ethnos nomos this unity of territory people their laws uh, and modern nations and nationalisms it is imagined and it can be reimagined and uh, in the post 1945 history um, uh, this uh, uh, was uh, something which was happening and evolving However, recent crises of transnational European society and uh, show first limits of integration, but also limited disintegration. For instance, Un uh, United Kingdom's withdrawal from the EU illustrates polyvalence and polysemy of constitutional imaginaries within and beyond modern statehood. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sure we will get back to it, but what really uh, gets on my nerves is this uh, caricature of Brexit as um, uh, uh, Tories uh, um, uh, thinking that uh, uh, Britain is still the empire. Yes, many people think about it, but it was exactly also, uh, um, uh, uh, it, the same can be said about exactly the opposite. There were many people on the left uh, who thought that Europe is the capitalist enterprise that has to be opposed um, by democratic mobilization. This is the tragedy of Britain that uh, here the left uh, the discourse of the left is very much uh, um, defined by the 19th century imaginaries. Yeah? But uh, we we have to we have to uh, uh, give it a full account and also compare it to what is going on in southeastern Europe. So European, uh, I will I will go very quickly because I want to finish uh, within my final uh, five uh, minutes. Uh, I want to return to Central Eastern Europe, but I want to show that European constitutional and legal culture and uh, identity doesn't or, or goes far beyond uh, just um, the identity of people living on the territory under one rule of law. That's it, that explains why, for instance, European constitution was such a disaster, political uh, and legal disaster. So uh, what about the Visegrad group legacy? Because now, if you uh, if you open Czech news, uh, very often, e even Czech president, the new Czech president said, well, Visegrad shouldn't be abolished, but should be um, uh, transvalued. Yeah? What is the value of Visegrad nowadays when Hungary is completely off the track, Poland is in uh, uh, big trouble, and uh, Slovakia is heading for big trouble, and Czech Republic, uh, it's uh, not all rosy there. Um, uh, as I always say, now we have the uh, president who is a former general of NATO, yes, for the country uh, or for the nation in which the most popular book is Good Soldier Schweik, this is pretty paradoxical. But um, in uh, with conscript army, uh, we used to have this two-year delay that uh, you, you could be declared unfit for military service. I think now Czech democracy has two-year delay period during which uh, democratic parties have to reassess and re-examine their policies um, and uh, already start mobilizing against the uh, uh, populists who otherwise might easily win. So what is this 
Visegrad Declaration. Initially, it was a symbol of democracy, post-communism, and building transnational integration. Like, we want to be part of it. Hungary, the best uh, uh, student in the club, the most advanced uh, uh, foreign policies, diplomatic efforts, and constitutional legal transitions at that time. Old Europe moving towards the Maastricht Treaty, um, Czechoslovakia going through a um, horrible constitutional crisis uh, and uh, collapse of federal statehood, uh, economic problems everywhere, but full of hope. So new Europe moving towards democracy, market economy, constitutional rights. This all We all know it very well. When you look at divergencies, this is my favorite uh, picture of Hungary. Uh, in which uh, Soros is to blame for everything. Uh, and uh, 10 years ago, uh, it already was pretty clear where we're heading. This is not just about Hungary. If you focus on extreme right-wing politics uh, and you, uh, you examine, for instance, uh, uh, rhetoric of extreme right-wing parties in uh, Austria, in uh, even in Germany, Ruth Vodak's work is uh, very, very important here. You can find it all there. Orban is not the most original authoritarian xenophobic leader. He really studied hard elsewhere. Um, European Commission uh, started uh, uh, acting against democratic backsliding, and this is where I want to stop because I'm sure this is where Gabor will uh, uh, will start. And uh, uh, it's uh, about um, um, yeah, many people are very critical about what Europe did or didn't, including me. Um, uh, I am, uh, but I'm much more critical of the European Parliament and the failure of representative political bodies of the European Union in treatment of the rise of illiberal, anti-democratic, authoritarian politics in Central Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Uh, what is what the Commission is doing now is uh, obviously this is uh, just the rule of law reports is the soft law, uh, but uh, what I want to finish with uh, uh, and uh, the question is: Is it too little, too late? Well, it's never too late to do this because it's interesting how, for instance, populist parties in the Czech Republic, how they learn lessons and how they carefully listen to what is coming from European Union uh, in terms of uh, uh, Polish and Hungarian policies. Um, so yes, the commission has some uh, rights, some powers, whether it's uh, used adequately, um, uh, we can discuss. Uh, I think uh, it should be a lot more robust, but uh, uh, I want to conclude by saying what is happening in Central Eastern Europe is profoundly affecting the whole European constitutional and general culture. And uh, what you can see uh, is uh, uh, you have transnational European society and you have transnational European network of nationalist, uh, um, uh, populist, uh, right-wing parties. Um, obviously, the war changes everything. So the Ukraine war is a great changer of politics, even in the Visegrad countries. And it's back to the history, it's back to the memory, it's back to the identity. Uh, and it's fascinating how uh, everything is about, in modernity, everything is about expectations, taking uh, precedence over experience, but at the same time, how experience define, uh, uh, how experience, past experiences define what we want 
in the future. And here I'm going to stop with the Czech example. It's uh, fascinating. Uh, 2015, uh, Czech Republic uh, uh, joined the populist uh, anti-refugee wave. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 last year, it was fascinating to see a completely different uh, um, uh, attitude towards the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, um, I think there are several reasons. One reason is uh, the historical past, 1938, the Munich uh, Agreement, 1968, uh, the, Czechos uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, and uh, at the same time, uh, the, uh, uh, the threat of Czech democracy and Czech statehood from the East. In other words, the tragedy of Central Europe revisited is going very strong in uh, Czech uh, culture right now. So Kundera revisited, Kundera uh, reinvented for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Yeji. This was really interesting. I hope we will have a, a, a nice discussion for, following later on. Um, our second speaker is uh, Professor Gabor Halmai. He is currently at European University Institute in Florence in Italy, and his talk is titled Memory Politics and Democratic Backsliding in Hungary. Uh, Gabor, please, you can take over. Oh, just try to unmute yourself first, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good good morning. Uh, uh, I try to share my my screen. I hope uh, I will be able. A couple of minutes ago, uh, it's not the one. I'm very sorry. Uh, I start the same problem again. Maybe I I will give give it up. Uh, can you see my screen now? Oh, surprise! Big surprise. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with you and be with my old friends, especially Yirji, who, as always, uh, provided a kind of uh, theoretical uh, foundation of my case study here. The case study, as you can see, is, is Hungary, my home country, and also, as, as called by my Princeton colleague, Kim Shapley, many times as a kind of Franken state, uh, collecting all the, the bad bad approaches from an authoritarian, populist, illiberal uh, state uh, with, with all the, the characteristics of, of those uh, uh, features. And hopefully it's also a kind of extreme, uh, and I very much hope that that the the end of the Visegrad uh, countries as as a term also means that all the other members of the former Visegrad uh, countries will be will be uh, uh, over with this this characteristic of of my home country's Franken state uh, features. So anyhow. Uh, this will be rather a kind of, of uh, descriptive uh, kind of presentation about uh, Hungary. With two main claims here. Uh, the first claim is that uh, during the democratic transition, the legal governance of, of, of history partly the, the transitional constitutionalism approach and also the transitional justice approach uh, may have contributed to the democratic uh, backsliding uh, about 
20 uh, years later uh, with uh, the very first Orban government, which uh, uh, collected the two-third majority of the seats in the Hungarian uh, parliament. So in other words, this, this kind of thesis of mine, uh, which I'm going to elaborate in a, in a, a paper uh, in progress, uh, claims that, that the way of the democratic transition, it's very elitist character and partly also uh, undemocratic character uh, using a lot of liberal and legal approaches uh, lacking any kind of, of participatory uh, elements, involvement of the people, the so-called people in that constitution making and, and uh, transitional justice uh, measures also contributed to the backsliding, uh, namely, and I go, go into these details very soon, because uh, the people do not really uh, uh, found this kind of approach of constitutionalism and governance of, of the history as their own. The second claim is that after the backsliding, the new autocratic uh, government of Viktor Orban, the force already uh, in, in, in row since 2010, started to use and abuse uh, memory politics for their own political uh, purposes. So let me start with the, with the first claim and first thesis. And without going into, into much details, uh, Yirshi uh, very nicely uh, described in the region of Eastern and Central Europe, let me only, only mention the, the main differences between uh, these democratic transitions in the region. The one type of, of, of transition can be called as a rapture type. Uh, the former Czechoslovakia uh, certainly belongs to this, as well as the former GDR. Uh, and this type is, is characterized with an immediate final constitution making process and at the same time a relatively hard transitional justice approach. While the other type of, of transition, mainly the, the two front runners of transitions, Poland and, and Hungary, which are at the same time also the, the current uh, uh, front runners of backsliding, uh, Hungary and Poland. Here, the constitution making process was based on a negotiated transition between the former Communist Party and the opposition movements and parties with a two step of constitution making, starting with a, a provisional. Uh, constitution or in the case of Hungary with a, uh, a comprehensive amendment to the communist constitution of 1949 and accompanied with a very mild uh, approach to transitional justice. So in other words, as I, I already uh, started to, to uh, describe this, this project in Hungary as part of this negotiated approach of democratic transition. This was very much an, an elitist project uh, with very major 
liberal democratic uh, aims and pursuits fulfilled in a in the mentioned <laughs> comprehensive amendment of the of the constitution with no no real uh, participatory consultation with the people i have to admit it's not not only and and exclusively a failure of of the elite uh since the people were very much very much occupied with with more more important existential changes of their life uh, as a consequence of the transition namely uh, raising the living standard uh, uh, reaching out uh, uh, the western standards of of living uh, and also uh, the lack of of former political and constitutional culture as as Yirji, uh, just uh, has emphasized uh, is also an important uh, element of this of this uh, lack of of participation and lack of interest from the side of the population to design a new uh, liberal democratic constitutional system i want to show this this first claim uh, by by mentioning the most important transitional justice measures but i could also mention other measures of the transition which which are equally uh, undemocratic and and liberal and legal in in their their nature namely the abolishment of the death penalty for instance while the the vast majority of the population was actually not opposing the death penalty but going going to the to the mentioned transitional justice measures here I listed four main uh, uh, parts of the transitional justice system uh, introduced uh, uh, during the transition. The first is, is the so-called retroactive justice, or in the case of Hungary, the rejection of retroactive justice by the uh, Hungarian constitutional court, a very active player of this legal constitutionalism uh, uh, approach uh, in the very beginning of of the of the transition, let's say in the very first ten years of the of the transition. This approach uh, provided by the by the decisions, many decisions of the Hungarian Constitutional Court preferred a kind of legal continuity with the previous regime, uh, emphasized legal certainty over substantive uh, justice, and uh, with that uh, approach rejected uh, using retroactive justice as it happened for instance in germany uh, or or partly happened in in czechoslovakia as well the second step also mentioned by by Yirji, the very mild approach of of screening lustrating former communist uh, uh, officials or or leaders who were certainly responsible or partly responsible for certain certain uh, uh, misdeeds of the of the communist regime partly crimes of the communist regime 
lustration was was uh, so mild that actually uh, there was no exclusionary uh, elements in this system. Even former uh, high-ranking communist officials uh, could have run for for high uh, uh, positions in the in the Hungarian uh, uh, transition. And the second democratically elected prime minister of Hungary, elected in 1994, uh, Gyula Horn, uh, was the former uh, minister of foreign affairs in the very last communist government. The third element of this, this mild uh, transitional justice approach is the, the compensation and the the avoidance of any kind of full compensation for, for reparation of, of previous uh, 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 takings by, by the communist regime of, of property. And finally, the fourth approach is the very, very limited access to the files of the of the previous regime with the explanation of certain data protection uh, and other liberal human rights fundamental rights uh, approaches so those liberal liberal uh, approaches were in contrast with a kind of of will of of the people to 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 have uh, retroactive justice to have a more serious lustration, to have some compensation, and to have access to the files of the previous regime. Since it did not happen due to this this uh, liberal uh, and democratic approach uh, by the elite and especially the legal elite uh, led by the Constitutional Court, the the concili uh, the 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 kind of uh, conciliation within the 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 society did not really happen uh, so let me go to the to the to the second part of my claim what happened after the so called counter revolution as ELG rightly characterized the change after 2010 when Viktor Orban uh, Fidesz party uh, won the election in 2010 with an absolute majority of the of the popular votes and due to the very disproportionate election system with a super two-third majority uh, of the seats in the parliament, which meant a constitution making majority. Uh, and Viktor Orban's uh, government uh, immediately used this opportunity to adopt a brand new constitution called the fundamental law, which was characterized by Viktor Orban himself very proudly that this is not a liberal constitution. The aim was to to introduce an illiberal constitution with the lack of separation of power, checks and balances, and guaranteed fundamental rights. What was important from the point of view of, of uh, memory politics and, and the legal uh, uh, governance of, of history in the preamble of this uh, uh, 2011 new constitution, uh, the, the uh, possibility to use retroactive justice as opposed to the prior constitutional court decision is one characteristic which may, may be called as a, as, a, as a right approach as opposed to the liberal one. I I very much criticized as a possible cause for, for backsliding. But in this case, I would say that Viktor Orban 
use this restorative justice approach uh, against the main opposition party, the former, uh, the successor of the former Communist Party, the main contender of of the of the Fidesz uh, 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 governing party uh, during the the. 2010 and 2014 elections, namely the Socialist Party, and trying to discredit not only the politicians, some politicians of that Socialist Party, but also also the entire party, uh, uh, labeling them as a success for, successor of the previous uh, uh, Communist uh, Party. Uh, the second element of this this uh, kind of of new approach uh, by the Orban government is a glorification of the pre-communist past, the Horthy regime, uh, in between uh, the two world wars, the denial, total denial of any responsibility of the Hungarian state in the Holocaust, uh, also uh, entrenched in the text of the preamble of the, of the uh, new constitution. And finally, and this is uh, uh, not necessarily uh, part of the constitutional text, but certainly part of the new constitutional uh, uh, culture, introduced by this, this uh, authoritarian uh, and populist uh, government, this entire renationalization of the public discourse, the signs of which are uh, new, newly introduced governmental research institutions, museums as the, the infamous uh, 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 House of Terror, uh, and new school textbooks uh, reinventing and rewriting uh, uh, history, renaming streets and re or deconstruction, constructing uh, monuments, uh, also, also uh, uh, telling the story of the glorious, glorious past of of Hungary before the communist time. So these are my main main uh, claims uh, how a failure in in legal uh, approaches to governing the past can contribute to a, a perfect misuse and and abuse of the history by an autocratic government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Halmai, for this uh, <clears throat> double uh, or like two part image of the uh, frontiers of the backsliding in Hungary. <laughs> Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Ulad Belavusau, who is a researcher at the TMC Asser Institute at the University of Amsterdam. And his talk is titled Belarus as an overlooked element in the puzzle of memory laws and wars in Europe. Ulad, please. Thank you for the floor. Uh, Chad, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here. It's a pleasure to see many friends and colleagues. Indeed, I'm echoing both uh, Yiji and uh, Gaber on that. So as the topic of my presentation today suggests, there is a certain puzzle in not having Belarus when we talk about memory loss and uh, memory wars in Europe, or when we try to theorize like Chadna, for example, does in her research or Ido playing a little bit in on the on the interface on on the borderline of concepts of constitutionalism and uh, memory mm, on something that i call mnemonic constitutionalism so in that game we can identify big regions 
One big region is, of course, and most obviously, Russian-Ukrainian memory wars, with Putin not having anything essential in his pocket better to justify the whole aggression in Ukraine with mass atrocities, but to claim the supposed denazification of the Ukrainian nation, again, uh, recycling this boring Russian propaganda, denying the agency to the Ukrainians, the language, the, hist the, the historical, historical specificities, and uh, uh, reproducing essentially the imperial Russian myth. Then we have Poland, a big actor there, right? Uh, producing perhaps the most scandalous memory law of 2018. I mean, scandalous in terms of its attention to the media, big actors like Israel, United States, many European countries, and commenting, commenting and reflecting on this, especially in the period between 2018, 2019, when the law was adopted. Uh, and this very interesting circle amongst those three countries, Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, positioning themselves and their ontologies through memory laws, again, certain ways of legal governance of historical memory, uh, essentially a French phenomenon, well forgotten of the early 90s and flourishing, I would say, in Central Eastern Europe under different uh, legal mantles. Um, and then we have Baltic region with their game of, of uh, memory of politics, essentially very self-distancing themselves from communism and proclaiming Soviet occupation. Then we have uh, a theater of memory politics in the Balkans, uh, to which there are many specialists today. And then countries like Belarus are one of the very few ones that have escaped, if you think about it, this whole attention, especially on the level of the constitutional status uh, and, and the history of constitutional law uh, in that region in the 90s, 2000s. I think to a large degree, uh, thanks for Belarus being, uh, well, somewhat a boring dictatorship, always in the friend of Putin's uh, friend zone with very little specialist working um, and specializing in that country. Yet things had to be changed, at least since 2022, when Putin um, unfolds his military aggression in Ukraine to a large degree from the territory of Belarus that is used as a puppet state and satellite and essentially a semi-occupied state with the self-proclaimed president, definitely not elected, at least as we know for sure since 2020. So what's getting there on the level of memory loss, memory politics, and how is it different from Russian or Ukrainian situations if the country is de facto uh, the third party in this uh, war between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine engaged? How does it resonate with memory loss and memory wars? Uh, in my presentation, I will guide you through four stages, which I'll try to summarize as rapidly as possible in the constitutional history of Belarus from its proclamation of the independence in the 90s. And then I will talk about the uh, legal invention, so to say, or reinvention of uh, uh, Belarusian, peculiar Belarusian legislator and under the mantle of the so-called genocide of the Belarusian um, people and the contribution of Lukashenko's constitutionalism into the flourishing of the mnemonic constitutionalism in the region. So if we divide this constitutional history of Belarus starting from the 90s with the parade of independence on the post-Soviet space, uh, I would first start with the, with the period between 1991 and 1994. That was the period of the parade of independence, of the flourishing nationalism. Belarus is not uh, an acceptance uh, there. In that brief period, it existed as a parliamentary uh, republic that as much as Ukraine or Baltic states has intended to proclaim a very, very deep post-colonial discourse, so to say, its identity, its uh, uh, language, despite the period of Russification that was very similar to uh, Russification unfolding somewhere in Kazakhstan or in Ukraine uh, before the proclamation of the independence in 1991. And then again, it also was the period of the symbolic return into the imagery, then uh, uh, talking in the language of Yizhi and, and uh, imagery of constitutionalism, of the reimagined um, statehood of the beginning of the 20th century, of the 1918, when Belarus, as well as Ukraine and 
many other countries in the region proclaimed the independence from the Russian Empire. And the return of the symbols, quite literally, the return of white, wet, white, red, white flag, the um, the court of arm, uh, Pagone, which was shared with Lithuania for the period of 1901-1994, thus building the history of Belarus as the successor of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the medieval state, again, a very contested and uh, um, historical construct in both in, in Lithuania and in Belarus, whether the great, great uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania was predominantly Baltic or Slavic state and capitalizing effectively on the historical mythology of that period. Things change in 1994 with eruption. Alexander Lukashenko, the so-called last dictator of Europe until 2022, comes to, to power with the first and perhaps the last independent elections in Belarus. First thing he does is the referendum of 1995, even before continuing essentially his uh, powers and his endless terms of re-election. The first referendum was actually about history and language. So it's about the return of the Soviet imagery. So the cancellation of the white, red, white uh, flag and the coat of arm, return to the Soviet symbols, symbols, reintegr proclamation of the reintegration with Russia, which led to the so-called union, puppet union state of um, uh, Russia and Ukraine, and reintroduction, the Yuri the second official uh, Russian language, but de facto, of course, the only official language in Belarus with extremely aggressive politics of de-Russification of everything from the judicial proceedings to the language of instruction in schools and in the universities, essentially freezing Belarus for uh, several decades uh, in this very strange um, kind of identitarian statehood where on the one hand, Lukashenko didn't really straightforward reintroduced Russian colonial myth. So it wasn't about the imperial imagination of the three sister nations where of course there are great Russians, small Russians and white Russians. It was rather about trying to reintegrate the uh, kind of the national concept conceptions about Belarusian imagery, let's say the uh, mythology of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and very aggressively reconcile it with the Soviet period of Belarus, which was proclaimed to be as the source of flourishing and statehood and uh, glory and uh, kind of everything that was good in the Belarusian history was positioned as belonging to the Soviet, uh, Soviet period. In this respect, it is, it is similar to the Russian historiography with the same concepts of great patriotic war instead of second world war, for example, and the same delimitation of the wars 1941 and 1945, then denial of the, let's say, of the occupation of uh, Poland, a patrician for this, so for, it, it was reimagined, of course, as just the reunification of the Belarusian nation, the Eastern uh, the Western Belarus uh, returns to its Eastern cradle and reunites and, uh, as the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic under the guise of the of the Soviet uh, Union. But that was also a very peculiar period of the coexistence of two historiographies. One that was enthusiastically um, kind of pertained by the school educators uh, by multiple organizations that despite the Russification and despite all the state propaganda and uh, imagery building going into the Soviet kind of parallel of building Belarusian historiography, were trying nonetheless to keep that um, Belarusian national myth alive, so to say, for uh, basically until the period of 2020, they were comp competing. So what was competing was not really Russian imperial myth. This is very important to understand, straightforward, right? But that was kind of the Soviet um, mythology of the Belarusian state as the period of its incredible glory. And then the, uh, the, uh, the let's say, the memory politics that was sustained by enthusiasts, uh, historians, uh, language educators that was positioning kind of trying to promote Belarusian national identity. This is an important factor to understand because why, let's say, Lukashenko until 2020, under all the polls in Ukraine, was voted as the most popular foreign politician. So if, if when Ukrainians were continuously year by year asked whom they would vote if the elections would be tomorrow amongst all the uh, world leaders, Lukashenko was gaining always the first place up to 2020. Uh, because 
Ukraine wasn't really positioned as the antagonistic agent, like in the Russian historiography and Putin's propaganda. Yet things changed in 2020 with the very unsuccessful uh, coup d'etat, when uh, about a million of people went to the streets of Minsk for peaceful demonstrations, which, in, which unfortunately ended up with multiple tortures, arrest, and essentially and sadly enough, the end of the civil society in Belarus. Tragically, Belarus is now one step away from North Korea, with uh, basically all the political activists either imprisoned or existing in di multiple diasporas, mainly in, neighbor in the neighboring Lithuania and Poland. And that is also the period that is important for the uh, reimagination of the memory politics in Belarus, because Lukashenko in that period all of a sudden makes a radical turn by integrating not only the uh, uh, Soviet memory politics as the dominant uh, historiographic myth that was supposedly uh, consolidating the, the Belarusian nation, but also getting more and more involved in transplanting Russian clear-cut colonial imperial mythology in, in Belarus. And for the first part uh, time, introduced some very aggressive memory laws. Here we're talking about January 2022, when just one month before the war, Lukashenko introduces into the criminal law the changes, Article 130, that postulates the eight to from eight to ten years of imprisonment for the denial of the so-called genocide against the Belarusian people. While it's true that taken as an isolated state, uh, Belarus suffered perhaps in terms of the pure victims of the World War II the most in the regions, with every third uh, dweller of Belarus um, basically being annihilated. Uh, it is important to understand that most victims of that period were, of course, ethnic Jews. So again, it's kind of reprivatization of the nation in in, 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 in a way borrowed from the Polish law of 2018, with the famous Polish so-called Holocaust law, yeah, the proclamation of the uh, again criminal criminal punishment for the for the attribution of the crimes committed by the Third Reich to the Polish nation, yeah, again, by the Polish nation absorbing the uh, Jewish trauma. So in the same way, it's kind of capitalizing and instru instrumentalizing the Jewish trauma in Belarus and uh, uh, consolidating a new mythology, but even more importantly, using it against the political opposition. So since then, we have the Belarus introduces the museums, uh, the uh, the uh, multiple publications, uh, uh, um, festivals, etc., dedicated to this genocide of the uh, commemoration of the genocide of the Belarusian people, each time positioning Belarusian opposition and the symbolics of red, white, wet, red, white, uh, white, red, uh, um, white flag, excuse me. So the one that was used by the political opposition, uh, um, respectively, during 2020 protests as collaborationists. So saying, like, look, guys, those are the collaborationists, those are the Nazis, uh, they need to be chased. And um, so, in a way, instrumentalizing this genocide of the Belarusian people for the uh, political purpose and further prosecution. Um, well, it was used uh, against the state cur state historical curators, the uh, the people who are who were trying to provide the excursions in, in uh, Minsk and other regions, and, and even against the uh, minorities. In the first place, the biggest enemies of the day are, of course, Polish and Lithuanian minority in Belarus since 2020s. Uh, Lithuania provided the domicile for the president-elect Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, and Poland has taken the most uh, most of the Belarusian political and economic refugees. So Belarusians now constitute the second group after ethnic group after um, Ukrainians, respectively, uh, in Poland. As I've said, civil society in Belarus as such on the territory of Belarus is that when we are talking about the standards of democracy, it's not even comparable to Russia. So Russia in comparison, Putin's Russia of 2023 in comparison to Belarus, it's almost a liberal state. When we are talking about Belarus, we talk about the cruelty, the level of punishments, the prison terms, uh, the tortures, the also the prison conditions, which are very... Um, comparable to what we hear uh, from from the the, the the bits that we hear from the 
let's say, um, refugees from Northern Korea. Uh, again, returning to the historical memory, it's not only the introduction of the aggressive memory law, so this criminal law about the genocide of the Belarusian people, which kind of fits now the puzzle. So at the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned a puzzle of memory loss where Belarus wasn't visible until 2022. Uh, in, it kind of uh, consolidates the Polish approach and, um, um, and the Russian approach, of course, with the uh, denial of the uh, glory of the uh, great patriotic war and the denial of the positive uh, side, positive part of the um, positive contribution of the Red Army, so to say. During the Soviet period, again, the criminal measurements that were introduced in Russia back in 2014, Belarus introduces something else, again, capitalizing on the uh, Russian example, in the aftermath and right after the war. So Ukraine was attacked on the 24th of February. On 27th of February, Lukashenko takes the referendum that was prepared, uh, announced like one or two months in advance, it wasn't prepared even a year in advance, where amongst other measures to um, one of the one of the amendments deals also with the historical uh, memory. So again, copy pasting the Putin uh, constitution of 2021 with its proclamation of the duty to memory and respect of the memory of the great patriotic war. So with two very peculiar articles, Article 15, on the historical truth and the memory of the heroic feat of the Belarusian people during great patriotic wars. And uh, perhaps my favorite article 54, everyone is obliged to protect the historical, cultural, spiritual heritage and other national values. The manifestation of the patriotism, the preservation of the historical memory of the heroic past of the Belarusian people are the duty of, of the every citizen of the Republic of Belarus. So again, for anybody acquainted with the constitutional history in uh, post-communist states, that resonates as a very familiar rhetorical trope. Um, that having having said that, uh, we Belarus also has a very strong uh, punitive legislation in the area. So since a couple of months before the reintroduction of this article in the constitution, there was also this very aggressive punitive memory law on the genocide of the Belarusian people. And that leads me to, um, to my conclusion, so to say. While the situation in Belarus is, uh, is, is, is tragic in, in, on many ways, you can be uh, arrested in Belarus for the pure crime of talking the Belarusian language on the streets of Minsk. You can be uh, tortured almost to, to death and imprisoned for 20 years for helping Ukrainians and uh, in, in, in ruining the railway connection between Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, we have multiple situations, not like one, two, it's literally almost hundreds of people arrested for likes in, in Facebook, then being tortured and being recorded and humiliated in public by public television. Uh, we have people who were arrested and still are in prison for almost uh, a year for a pure crime of singing a song in the Ukrainian language on the streets of Minsk. Yet something is also very important has been going on on the legal level. So if we analyze the period between 1994 when Lukashenko came to power in 2020, it was a very aggressive and in a way boring recycle of the myth of the great patriotic war and Belarusian playing in, in, in a terribly important role there. Since 2020, Belarus becomes also clearly a uh, colonial state uh, where Lukashenko is a completely illegitimate uh, leader of the nation who not only capitalizes on his vassal relations with Russia, but also reintroduces not only Soviet myth, but imperial Russian myth as the justification of war uh, in Ukraine. Further on, we have something which fits very well into this theory of demonic constitutions that I'm developing. So the idea that um, constitutional ontologies and imageries can be explained uh, by the uh, 
limitations of the power which are embedded in the constitutional project themselves. So the self-voluntary recognition of the state to limit its powers, governments of, of, of limiting their powers can be also based on certain historical ontologies, yeah? So re reproducing them and being uh, limited by them. Uh, and we can see it as a very strong case of, let's say, um, Hungarian constitutional uh, provision, particularly in its preamble and its U article, so the 2011 Orban's constitution, a very powerful mnemonic constitutionalism. We can see it in the Russian case of 2021 with the introduction of the right to truth and, and this proclamation of the sanity of the memory of, uh, or, or, you know, sanity, sanctuary of the memory of great, of the great patriotic war. But for, to have strong mnemonic constitutionalism, one doesn't need to have uh, a rule of law downgrade and B doesn't even need to have a constitution. So we could take the case of Israel that even in the absence of the constitution, formal constitutional text, I mean, the basic law builds its constitutional tradition on the law of uh, return with a very strong historical paradigm about the history of Jewry. And this is not the, 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 the unique case. So we can take Poland that uh, uses the same modes of downgrading of the rule of law and memory being engaged there. So, so something which resonates very well with the, with the presentation of government, but without changing the constitution by virtue of the uh, Institute of the National Remembrance with quasi-parliamentary uh, functions and the same, the laws that postulate this ontological power of history in justifying the present choices, right? Belarus in that regard fits this rule of law tendencies of the downgrade with the, with the only disclaimer that rule of law doesn't exist there since 1994. Uh, but what we observe what we can observe in Belarus fitting the, 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 the puzzle of Central Eastern, Eastern European states is this recent tendency of very powerful, very strong uh, mnemonic constitutions. Again, this race to impose the certain historical myths within the, the constitutional text, and then this know-how in instrumentalizing them also in the context uh, of war. So at this at this point, I will perhaps uh, limit my freedom of expression. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulan, for uh, this um, nice talk that illuminates the Belarusian case, Belarusian case. And um, I will just remind our um, listeners that you can post your questions through Q and A uh, function on Zoom or a chat box in um, if you follow us on YouTube. And our last presenter is uh, Alen Kantloga, who is uh, teaching at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And her talk is titled The Nexus Between Identity Formation to the Lens of the Bosnian Constitution and the Right to Stand for Elections in a Post-Conflict Society. Alenka, please. Well, good afternoon. Also from my part here in Slovenia, I have graduated at the Faculty of Law. I'm currently employed elsewhere. Uh, my deepest appreciation to the Hereman Institute for the um, invitation. My presentation today will be about the nexus between identity formation through the lens of the Bosnian constitution and the right to stand for elections in a post-conflict society. I will start with the presentation of the formation of the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a state building process. The general framework agreement for peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina was signed in December in 1995, and it enabled the formation of the Constitution of Bosnia as an export to the peace agreement. The society in Bosnia has a multi ethnic character, and to end the armed conflict in Bosnia, the consensus of all three main ethnic groups was needed. The Constitution has therefore been adapted to the specific political situation in Bosnia in the year 1995. And Bosnia was divided into two entities, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Republika Srpska. In the Constitution, the constituted peoples are defined as Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs, and a person decides on his or her ethnic affiliation only by self-classification. Bosnia became a member state of the Council of Europe in the year 2002, and the European Court of Human Rights leaves the high contracted parties a wide margin of appreciation regarding the limitation of the right to stand for elections. 
but it also emphasizes the principle of subsidiarity. However, after the country has ratified the convention, the rights guaranteed by it apply directly. The Article 7, the second paragraph of the Constitution in Bosnia, also emphasized the direct applicability of these rights and freedoms set forth in the European Convention. Uh, that was also mentioned in several other agreements, but also in the separate opinion, for example, uh, in the decision of the Constitutional Court in 2006. It says that the European Convention is not only directly applicable, but it has on the basis of the second article of the Constitution priority over any other law and that the term over any other law should also imply the European Convention as a part of the whole legal system. The Parliamentary Assembly in Bosnia is bicameral, meaning the lower house uh, being the House of Representatives and the upper house the House of the Peoples. The House of the Peoples is elected indirectly and comprises of 15 delegates. So two thirds are coming from the Federation of Bosnia and one third from uh, Republic uh, Serbska. The presidency of Bosnia is a collective head of state. It consists of three members. So again, this, um, the same division. Uh, one representative is the representative of the Bosniaks, one the Croat, and each are directly elected from the territory of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And one representative is the representative of the Serbs directly elected from the territory of the Republic of Srpska. In accordance with Article 4 and 5 of the Constitution, only candidates who declare affiliation with constituted peoples are entitled to stand for elections to the House of Peoples and the Presidency. The elections are regulated by the Constitution, the election law, and several other legislation. The election law in Bosnia is from 2001. It has been amended several times. Uh, for example, the last year it was amended on the 27th of July by the decision of the High Representative regarding the so-called transparency package, and uh, with which the High Representative imposed some changes during the election campaign for the general election that took place on the 2nd of October last year in Bosnia. A few words about the High Representative. The mandate of the High Representative was set out by several international agreements. Uh, maybe the most known is the Bonn Peace Implementation Conference held in 1997, and uh, which uh, the High Representative uh, from that conference on had also the power to remove from public office any public officials which he considered to be in violation of the peace agreement. So these removals, of course, uh, regarding the whole situation, had a legitimate aim to force the cooperation with the ICPY. However, there was no court decision and the high representative is not elected by the people in Bosnia. Article 9 of the Constitution regards the ineligibility to stand as a candidate or hold any other public office for a person who is serving a sentence imposed by the ICTY who is under indictment or has failed to comply with an order to appear before that court. Again, the question remains whether um, such provisions are perhaps incompatible with equal right to stand for elections under several international uh, international conventions, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The limitations of the right to stand for elections by the jurisprudence of the European Court are usually relating to minimum age, criminal convictions, holding a public office, sufficient knowledge of the working language, etc. The ineligibility to stand for elections has to have an objective and reasonable justification. The European Court enables the countries a very wide margin of appreciation. However, it always considers whether the domestic proceedings in a certain country have been arbitrary. The right to vote and the right to stand, elect, uh, to st uh, to stand for elections is defined in the Article 3 of Protocol 1. However, these rights are not absolute. The limitations of the right to stand for elections, they must fulfill certain criteria. For example, the Venice Commission um, has listed quite a few in the Code of Good Practice in electoral matters. Uh, limitations must be provided for by law. The proportionality principle must be observed. Conditions for depriving individuals of the right to stand for elections must uh, can be less strict than those for dispensing them, etc. In Bosnia, the right to stand for elections for the House of Peoples and the Presidency is limited to all who do not want to declare affiliation with one of the constituted peoples, who are belonging to minorities in each entity, 
or to other members of the constituted peoples in each entity that is not a majority in that entity. So in case of Bosnia, these challenge provisions of the constitution are a combination of ethnic origin and a place of residence. Uh, the European Court has said several times that discrimination based on ethnic origin is a form of race discrimination. And in, the, in all the cases so far that were held against Bosnia, it said that Article 3 of Protocol 1 is applicable for the elections to the House of Peoples, and that there has been a violation of Article 14 of the Convention in conjunction with this article. And regarding the right to stand for elections for the presidency, it has found that there has been a violation of Article 1 of Protocol 12, so the general prohibition of discrimination since the presidency is not a legislative party. There has been several judgments, as I previously mentioned. The, perhaps the best known one was Savic and Finci versus Bosnia in 2009. This was the first case of discrimination based on ethnicity, race, regarding the limitation of the right to stand for election. Um, perhaps the case Pila versus Bosnia was also um, uh, quite uh, unique regarding that the, the decision of the Constitutional Court in Bosnia in 2006 that was, uh, of course, an act before the Strasbourg decision, uh, was um, elaborated in the way that the court mentioned that uh, Bosnia has a specific internal structure of the state with a, pers uh, with a um, purpose to preserve peace among the three ethnic groups. However, there is, of course, a certain discrimination in the constitutional legislation, but within the margin of appreciation reasonable and not arbitrary since it is based on law. So the Constitutional Court of Bosnia in 2006 uh, took a stand that the trans transition in Bosnia from a post-conference society was not yet completed and that this kind of provisions are actually needed and necessary. The construction of state organs is a system of state uh, checks and balances between the three ethnicities is a specific way of, of course, forming a state constitution and the whole legal system. It's without, it's, has been with a le uh, legitimate aim to enable peace in this region after the war, however, not outside the margin of appreciation. All member states of the Council of Europe are obliged to respect and execute the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Bosnia has yet to do so. The constitutional reform in Bosnia would have to be part of the transitional justice process and also uh, with the aim to ensure the effective political democracy regardless of the identity formation of the Bosnian society through these three main ethnicity groups. Thank you so much, uh, Alenka, for uh, such a concise, uh, concise and, and uh, brief uh, presentation. Uh, before we proceed with Q&A section, I would like to actually introduce um, uh, senior political officer and constitutional constitutional advisor, uh, Department um, of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs at the United Nations, uh, Mr. Rohan Medesinha, uh, who would like to make a short comment on constitution building in post conflict societies. Uh, so please. Well, thank you very much, Alexander, and th thank you very much for the four presentations. I should clarify that. I wanted to sit in on this seminar so that I could learn a little bit about an area of the world that I'm pretty ignorant about. And Chana made it a condition that I have to say something uh, if I were to participate. And so I'm, I was uh, actually interested in Bosnia uh, because in my work, I was asked for some uh, advice on Bosnia and I was really struck by uh, the issue of the role of the international community. And it raises all sorts of questions that I think we in the United Nations also have to reflect on. Uh, obviously, it's easy to be wise after the event. And I recognize that there were enormous challenges at the time of data. But I think the lesson from Bosnia is uh, that maybe the international community has to ask the question, whether that needs to be minimum thresholds with respect to standards and norms when it does get involved in facilitating a peace agreement. And uh, that's one of the issues I'd like to flag. The second that comes to mind is the gap between rhetoric and reality. 
at the United Nations, I sometimes feel almost embarrassed at how the leadership keeps on talking about the importance of conflict prevention. And the member states too keep on passing resolutions emphasizing the importance of conflict prevention. And uh, some of you might be aware that in 2016, the General Assembly and the Security Council passed without any opposition, the sustaining peace resolutions, which talk about the primacy of the political in the work of the UN, addressing root causes of conflict, promoting national reconciliation, ensuring non-recurrence, uh, promoting inclusive governance and human rights. But notwithstanding that rhetoric, I feel that the UN and the international community often is satisfied with just stopping violence. And they, they, their attention uh, sort of comes to the fore when there is violence and uh, they don't really in, have a strategy to deal with conflict prevention. And then of course, the international community does very little beyond the stopping of violence. And so the third point on the international, uh, the role of the international community is whether the international community needs to ask itself whether it has the patience and the commitment to go beyond just stopping violence and to do those things that it uh, talks about in its rhetoric about um, conflict prevention. And so in the Bosnian case, uh, should the international community have done more to ensure that what has been called by some scholars as a Dayton constitution actually became or becomes a Bosnian constitution. And another point that uh, I think comes out in some of the issues that Alenka discusses in her paper too, is that sometimes what works short term might have negative consequences longer term, right? And this is uh, uh, not only in Europe, but I think in other contexts as well. A short term solution can sometimes generate its own longer term problems and the international community, I think needs to be aware of that. Two other brief points, if I may, before I end. Uh, the other uh, lesson for me from Bosnia as an outsider, as someone who comes from a very different part of the world, is um, the whole question of managing diversity and dealing with the reality of identity politics. I'm much more familiar with Asia, where I come from, and we don't have this emphasis on memory uh, as much as identity, but um, I was struck when I was listening about uh, listening to the presentation on Bosnia and about the challenges ahead, about how uh, federalism too has its own limitations. And sometimes federalists make the mistake of focusing only on the self-rule dimension of federalism, not the shared rule and this, the, the importance of common institutions. And so the constitutional court in Bosnia, I think is one of those common uh, institutions that needs uh, as much support as possible. And of course, the high representative. And my last point is uh, a number of the presentations, particularly the first two focused on the rise of populism. And uh, in my work, uh, we, we have to deal not only with that, but also something that is connected with the rise of populism, but is not necessarily always connected to the rise of populism. And that is the growing disenchantment that people have about constitutions, democratic institutions, and in a sense, the political class. And just to, to, to emphasize the fact that it's happening all over the world, if you look at Peru and Ecuador and Bolivia and in, in South America, if you look at South Africa and Tunisia, and if you look at my own country, Sri Lanka, uh, you know, and what's been going on in the last year, and even in Pakistan, you will see that it's almost as if there's this huge and growing disconnect between the political class on the one hand and ordinary people on the other. So much so that in my own country, Sri Lanka, people are beginning to ask the question, why do we need politicians? Why can't we rule ourselves? And of course, that in itself has its own dangers, right? That that kind of direct democracy, uh, populist discourse. And I really think that uh, this is a challenge for all of us and certainly for constitutionalists around the world, but it emphasizes the fact that in the Bosnian case, uh, I think it's really important that uh, uh, 
as in the future, I know the situation has lasted now for 25 years, but I wonder whether it can continue to last, the increased polarization, and whether at some point the people need to be more engaged in creating a, a, a more, a Bosnian constitution that is more compatible with the theory of constitutionalism that was talked about in the first two presentations. And here again, I'd like to end by asking the question whether the international community has to take the lead in trying to ensure that. And of course, in the Bosnian case, we in the UN have been told it's the EU and the USA, not the UN, that has to take the lead in facilitating that kind of initiative. But thank you very much uh, to all the presenters. And thank you, Alexander and Shachana, for asking me to say a few words. Thank you, Rohan, so much. Um, maybe this could be actually our uh, starting point for Q&A, uh, Rohan's question, if anyone wants to um, uh, respond or comment on it. Um, and also I'll, I'll, I'll leave the floor to Charna if you, Charna, have uh, a follow-up question. Uh, Thanks. So I, I will take this opportunity only to, uh, I, I don't have questions for now, but only to uh, to say uh, one another thing. Uh, okay, so um, since we are a bit late with, uh, with, uh, with the panels, uh, I would like to ask to, to the speakers of the second, so the next panel, if they're able to speak if we can change the second panel with the third one, only because the speakers uh, of the of the third panel uh, have some other commitments uh, uh, after, so if we can uh, do this replacement, so to have the third panel after the first one and then the second as a third. When would the third the second panel then start? What time? Oh, let's see, we will have now it's uh, 140, 140. Uh, so that would be uh, for Europe, that's what, 7.30? Yes. No. No, okay, so maybe we can uh, leave your presentation uh, in the second, so it, it, it was uh, as it was scheduled initially. And then if uh, Irena and Anna can, Maybe we can change their presentations for later. Yeah, it's a bit tricky also for me. Um, what maybe I can suggest is that we have uh, shorter presentations. Okay. On yes. The second panel. I don't know, yes. uh, Alina, what yes. do you And think? then maybe we can yeah. have a two and day session at the end. Yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Uh, so I also would like to, to hear from, uh, uh, from, uh, J Jim, Jim Waller and Kerry Wigam, if this could be a solution for them. Hmm. So to try to have shorter presentations. Yeah, that should work for me. I just have to, uh, I have to leave by 1.30 p.m. New York time, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, so let's try to have shorter presentations, so. Yes, so we can continue with the, with the Q&A session so to close the, the first panel. So maybe we can also start with the speakers. Maybe they have so some some questions or comments. Okay, maybe yeah. I, I was the first one, so I will I will start with uh, the question uh, with, with uh, responding to what Rohan said. What uh, uh, really. Uh, I think it's very important, and I completely agree that populists uh, are didn't appear out of nowhere. They are a symptom of the more general crisis, uh, uh, and uh, 
Uh, it's interesting how they exploit identitarian politics, uh, not just in Central Eastern Europe, but uh, everywhere. Um, the difference uh, between, th there is a difference between uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, or what, what is sometimes uh, called old and new Europe, and it's the robustness of institutions. So um, uh, the big um, difference is in fragility uh, of uh, legal, political, and constitutional institutions uh, uh, in uh, former communist countries. And uh, that's why uh, France has a complete collapse of the party politics. Yeah? And uh, at the same time, still, the state works. Um, Italy has a right-wing populist uh, leader, post-fascist uh, political party, and uh, yet uh, uh, the Italian state isn't threatened. Yet, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, what Orban did, uh, what Kwasniewski is doing, and what uh, people like Babish or Fitzo could do is they really could uh, destroy um, uh, democratic politics. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is something which uh, is uh, important to bear in mind. And uh, um, I, I would call, therefore, for strong institution building, something that uh, certainly Rohan is very familiar with from uh, his uh, work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, also Gabor for uh, want, wants to comment to the same question. Uh, thank you, Yerji. Yes, this is a, a kind of follow up what what Yerji just have said. So one one major characteristic of populism in our East Central European uh, region is that it's always accompanied with certain illiberal ideas, uh, certain autocratic uh, pursuits of, of those mostly nationalistic uh, uh, populists, which is not necessarily the case elsewhere. Uh, so Yeshi has mentioned the, the right-wing populism in Italy. There is also uh, left-wing populism uh, in, in Western Europe, uh, let's see Podemos or Syriza, uh, or, or even, even Cinque Stelle in, in, in Italy, not necessarily uh, left-wing, but certainly not right-wing either. So, and those are not, not uh, uh, necessarily or or mostly not illiberal and not autocratic so i i agree with Yerji that populism is a kind of of consequence or sign of of failures but not all populism uh, is to blame for for our our crisis situation altogether uh, those illiberal autocratic, nationalistic uh, ones certainly are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor, for commenting on that. Um, any other comments, questions among the participants? Well, I think if you don't have any more questions, maybe we can close it here and um, continue with the panel, the next panel, Charla. Yeah, sure. So we can uh, we can open uh, the the second pa panel. So trying to maybe to have a, a little more shorter presentations. 
so the second panel will be dedicated to the Europeanization of memory and nationalism. And our first speaker is Anna Milosevic from KU Leuven University in Belgium. And she will give us uh, a speech about, uh, so she will focus on the future without the past, Europeanization, uh, memory, and the Western Balkans. Uh, so Anna, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And also, I will try to be as short as possible. I don't have a presentation, but you can enjoy the view of my garden in southern Italy, which is very, very nice. Um, so my talk for today is, um, well, provocatively um, uh, titled uh, A Future Without the Past. If you talk to my fellow colleagues in the Western Balkans, either political scientists or historians, and ask them what is the effect of Europeanization of memory on, in the Western Balkans, they will sarcastically reply that the future might seem more certain than the past. And of course, um, imagining Europe as a, as a place of uh, shared memory uh, posed and continues to pose a, a very important challenge for both policymakers and scientists. But as well, um, in the Western Europe, um, uh, imagining Euro uh, the Balkans as a, as a place of shared memory uh, seems even more, even more challenging. So what I want to do today is uh, I want to walk you through three key points of uh, my presentation. So first, I want to illustrate divisive rather than unifying potential uh, that is ascribed to collective memory on transnational European level. Uh, second, I want to observe the role of the past, the role of collective memory in building the European, um, uh, European project by observing the process of European integration and what kind of role did the past had uh, in this process. And thirdly, I want to look at the consequences, either intended or unintended consequences of Europeanization of memory in the Western Balkans specifically. And while looking at these uh, consequences of Europeanization of memory politics in the Western Balkans, I want to also to touch upon maybe um, some of the, let's say four or five factors that shape what is the final product of Europeanization of memory in that specific region. And I call that, that final product the uh, memorial, memorial uncultured. So uh, the history of the use of uh, the past at the European level is actually a history of hitting moving targets. And uh, there are three main stages, let's say, three main processes that um, the European Union has passed over the time in which the past has been used differently. So first, um, the very uh, founding myth of the uh, creation, let's say, of the of the European 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 Union, is tied specifically to the events of the Second World War, and in this, um, let's say, the first, uh, let's say, uh, process, the first stage of the uses of the uh, of the past, um, we can see that the history um, that the past actually uh, uh, that the future, sorry, that the future. Uh, was a dominant time category. So the past uh, wasn't that important. So it was the future that was based on the consensus that the past uh, was something that the Europeans have left behind. And this foundational myth of the community draws precisely on the consensus on the future, on rebuilding Europe from the ashes of the Second World War, which is let's say best illustrated in the, in the promise of uh, never again. So this was the future that uh, was envisioned in which Germany regained trust again. There was the reconciliation process that became the main knot and the main strength of the European project. And it was the victory of that specific time over history. So this was the, the future that the European founding fathers have envisioned uh, for the Europe. It was the future without the burdens of the past and the future in which reconciliation and solidarity, mutual trust and respect would prevent this kind of a future um, cultures um, of 
violence. So, of course, this initial success of the political economic integration needed to be reinforced with the political support. And here we can see how the collective memory, how the history of the, the Second World War starts being uh, quite important because we um, got introduced in, in this equation, it, goes, it gets introduced the um, European identity and the search that the European Union had for that kind of European identity. They wanted to, to um, uh, support the, the, the objectives uh, of shifting loyalties from the national to the transnational, supranational uh, level. And of course, this is tied to the, uh, the growing powers and um, uh, that the European institution had over that time, specifically around the 70s and 80s, when we saw that um, uh, institutions such as the European, uh, European Parliament uh, grew institutional powers. And here we see that the institutions of the European Union also diversified their own roles. And then it starts this uh, process of hitting moving targets, focusing on something that could unite uh, Europeans together. So we, we see there was development of the youth policy. There was the um, development on the cultural heritage policy, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the second stage uh, actually of the uh, uses of the, the past in the European integration process it would be the one that started after the end of the Cold War, when we had this process of consensus making on the past. And some authors will also say that the, the lines between different and divergent histories among European countries were sort of blurred by this process, political process rather than societal, on consensus making on the past. And that consensus, um, as previous speakers have uh, eloquently explained, uh, regarded this old and new Europe, these different historical experiences that the countries in Europe had in the Second World War, meaning that the main, uh, let's say, um, uh, memory canon of the Western Europe in remembering the, the Second World War was the Holocaust. And for the countries that exited um, uh, the uh, totalitarian uh, regimes in the East, um, that uh, specific memories became the memories of the communism uh, under the, 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 the Soviet rule. And um, it is in this process that we have this kind of um, two different realities also uh, of Europeanists. So Europeanists that is pursued uh, by the EU as a political project and on the ground accepted forms of uh, Europeanists. Um, and the uses um, uh, of the past by the old and new uh, member states um, of the European Union. So without entering into details about the Euro European constitution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera I want to just um, maybe focus briefly on uh, the actually the birth of the uh, European memory framework, a set of political, uh, let's say, uh, resolutions, soft laws uh, on the European level and by the European Parliament, by which the European Union assumed the role of being that, um, uh, that force that is striving to reconcile different um, different histories. Uh, it is in that period uh, around uh, 2000 with the processes of European integration of Central Eastern European countries that we have seen the boom of this kind of soft laws, memory policies uh, on the European level that were initiated mainly by the new member states, countries that came from the Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, um, these countries uh, using European Parliament and using these soft laws resolutions upload their own national histories, their own national memories, their own grievances, um, uh, historical grievances on the European level. Uh, by adopting this kind of a set, sets of uh, resolution, 
what actually resulted is this kind of EU memory, uh, memory framework, uh, as I call it, uh, with two main pillars. The first one being, as I mentioned, the Holocaust, and the second one being a set of resolutions that supports the view of the anti-totalitarian past, the rejections of all forms of totalitarian and, and dictatorial uh, regimes throughout the Europe in the past and in the present. So this was this acute moment in of the use of the, um, the history at the European level that produced not only these kind of sets of uh, resolutions and soft laws that were later on adopted by different, different countries, but they are not legally binding soft laws, but it also introduced um, uh, a complete new set of memorial practices, European commemorations, European uh, monuments, et cetera, et cetera. The third um, uh, momentum, let's say, of the use of uh, the past on European level is what I call the European memory wars. It is for me, um, in my view, uh, the period that we are actually uh, at at, at, the, at this point. Uh, where we can see that this uh, political search of the European Union for a common European history is actually backlashing, because we can see that the Europeanization of uh, memory politics at the global level, at the level of the countries that want to join the European Union and the countries that have joined the European Union, has produ producing this kind of different results. In relation to the Western Balkans, where we have a set of different countries with different histories, but also countries that have shared among them a uh, history of uh, being in one, um, one state in Yugoslavia until the 1990s and the war in the 1990s, these kind of, um, these kind of EU memory frameworks have produced um, a quite a different range of results. So what we have seen in the, well, the book that we just published last year or during the pandemics, uh, talking about Europeanization and memory politics in the Western Balkans, uh, we have analyzed um, all the countries in the Western Balkans in their process of European integration, of aligning also with European mnemonic norms. And we'd accepted, let's say, discourses when it comes to talking about the past, using the past uh, on this um, transnational European level. And we have seen that um, countries have responded in a similar way, um, meaning that in the process of pre-accession, the countries see, seek to download this European memory framework, these kind of soft laws made by the European parliament, and try to adopt it in their national parliaments. For instance, um, a resolution made by the European Parliament that adopts this kind of anti-totalitarian stance is adopted in Serbia in the pre-accession, was adopted in Croatia during the, the pre-accession of Croatia. And this adoption of, um, an adoption of these kind of resolutions later on transforms into um, uh, the country's um, way of um, uh, promoting its own Europeanness, its own belonging to Europe, its own endorsement of European norms of remembrance. But what happens after the country uh, joins the European Union is this kind of processes of Europeanization of memory are actually being reversible, uh, meaning that um, Europeanization itself, as my dog, Europeanization of memory itself, it has um, a little transformative, uh, little transformative um, value. In um, other countries, such as, for instance, um, in, uh, in Serbia, we have seen that the transitional justice processes, uh, when it comes to the wars in the 1990s, have also played an important role in aligning with the Europeanized forms of uh, remembrance. So um, we have seen that when the European Parliament, for instance, um, created a soft resolution on Srebrenica, uh, seeking to um, put some kind of a pressure on the country to deal with the past of the 1990s, that uh, Serbia has responded with a very long uh, process of um, uh, creating a similar resolution in its um, in its own national parliament, and by it endorsing the European canons of uh, remembrance. Um, 
what I want to say, maybe in conclusion, because I think I used uh, that limited time that I wanted to 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 uh, use for my presentation, is that um, Europeanization of memory is somehow uh, also linked to the uh, these uh, transitional justice processes, not only in the Western Balkans, but it can be seen as a belated transitional justice mechanisms a mechanism also at the global European level. So what I mean by this is that the European Union also in a similar way like the, the, the Western Balkan countries has used the collective memory, has used this um, <clears throat> uh, processes of uh, Europeanization, of consensus making of the past as a way to uh, reconcile histories and pacify tensions um, uh, in order to uh, promote this kind of uh, 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 this kind of uh, reassurances of security and uh, non repetition, but we have also seen in the Western Balkans that uh, and elsewhere in Europe that Europeanization of memory on the ground it's on it's on the ground effects actually are not um, free of politicization uh, of course. And the, the ownership of these kind of national uh, memories stays within the nation, nation states. What I mean by this is that Europeanization of memory hardly challenges this ownership that the nation states have over the, their, own, uh, their own past. And by uploading the national uh, memories on European level, European Union then becomes um, opportunity platform for the countries to raise their own grievances, to um, bargain in a certain way uh, with their past and with their political objectives, seeking sometimes to induce pressure on other countries to resolve issues that are of national importance. So we can talk very, very um, uh, at length uh, on this topic, but I will think, I think I will stop here. And I tried to speak as fast as possible to say as many things as possible, but hopefully there will be questions that I can answer and clarify maybe some of the things that I have said. Thanks, thanks, Anna, for this uh, wonderful present, very, very rich uh, presentation in in uh, in, a, in a short time. So um, uh, I would like only to say that. Uh, uh, we decided, so since the speakers of the third panel have some meetings and since we are a little bit late with, uh, with, uh, with other panels, so we decided to, uh, mm, so we will not have uh, today the third panel, we will uh, uh, see if uh, we'll have the possibility to schedule it for one another day, so speakers uh, from the second panel can have between, still between uh, 15 and, and 20 minutes. Uh, for their speeches, and then uh, we will uh, open uh, the Q&A session as originally indicated. So um, our next speaker will be Ellen Sierp uh, from the Maastricht University, Netherlands, and uh, she will give us a presentation on United in Conflict uh, Memory Politics in the European Union. Uh, so, uh, Ellen, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in a way, uh, I think there's a lot of overlap with Anna's presentation, so that makes it easier for me to cut. Um, it might also make it easier for the audience because it will go into a bit more detail when it comes to certain issues. So maybe some questions that arose after Anna's presentation might be answered by mine. Um, I actually have a PowerPoint presentation um, to help you uh, focus. So I will just share my screen and hope that this works. Ah, sorry. Just exit it again, there. Um, can you see it? Okay, great. Um, then I will, I will start. Um, so uh, I was basically asked to uh, provide you with some sort of introduction um, to the role that memory politics has played in the European Union since its inception, um, and then zoom in um, on the East-West divide um, within the European Union. And I already um, said uh, a few things about it and indeed, um, I think it is one of the most interesting um, elements to study. Um, memories have played an important role um, in the establishment of many international organizations. Um, so it's running like a red thread really um, through most thinking um, in the Organization for Economic, uh, European Economic Cooperation, um, the Council of Europe, um, NATO, um, and then of course the European Coal and Steel Community, which was the forerunner of what today is the European Union. 
Um, Anna already mentioned that this uh, has become some sort of bounding myth. Um, it certainly was um, memories of World War II were uh, very present in the, in the very first uh, years of the European Union when the European Union was founded. Um, and it was particularly this idea that um, the EU was a peace project in response to the experiences of war and dictatorship um, that um, made these memories stay very present um, in the very early years of integration. And certainly since the Schumann Declaration on the 9th of May 1950, um, it has been very central to the master narrative um, of the European Union. So it's repeatedly being evoked um, in uh, official documents and political speeches um, and to a certain, uh, certain uh, extent has also influenced the setup of the UNIS institutions. Now, if you consider this, it's actually quite surprising that EU activism in this um, context has remained for very long exclusively on the level of symbolic politics. We also have to keep in mind, this, of course, that uh, European competences in this uh, field were extremely limited as well. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there has been no concrete EU policies that were devised um, in the early years of European integration. Um, and indeed, as Anna mentioned, um, this changed in the 1970s. Um, this was due to the oil crisis, uh, among other factors, and the ensuring loss of confidence of many European citizens in the European integration project. Um, that uh, made policy makers understand that one cannot fall in love with a common market. Um, that's a famous quote by Jacques Delors. And this was the moment when culture and cultural policies acquired a new meaning as a glue that could hold Europeans together, especially in times of crisis. Now, initially, um, efforts that had to do with memory and identity politics um, were um, uh, concentrating on promoting a common European heritage. Um, so the first program that was um, seeing the life of day was the European Capitals of Culture program. Um, and that still exists today. It's, I think, the flagship program really of the European Union when it comes to heritage policies. Um, it was born in 1985. Um, and I think more than any other program really incarnated the idea um, that there is some sort of common um, memory and identity which goes beyond abstract political and economic principles. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change the, the slide. So this was the first slide um, with my uh, uh, yeah, um, few, few um, um, ideas when it comes to that. Um, the early years of the uh, European Capitals of Culture program um, were focused exclusively on positive heritage. Um, and in the 1970s, then the history of European integration also became the focus of commemoration. Um, that was some sort of teleological narrative that was created um, and uh, that is still to a certain extent present um, in many ways in today's European Union. But it did not prove to be very successful with citizens. Um, the 1990s then um, saw the willingness to also include negative elements, so for example, um, the heritage of concentration camps um, into the list of heritage sites um, that, that warranted protection. Um, but it took really until um, fairly late before yeah, these negative elements were also commemorated actively. Um, and that is the same on the national level. We all know that it took a long time before World War II and the Holocaust actually um, were uh, yeah, discussed in a more critical way, um, also on the national level. So this was not uh, the case in 1950s and 1960s. Uh, not even in Germany, which was a perpetrated country. Now, the end of the Cold War exacerbated those developments further. Um, it was specifically the breaking open of the bipolar world um, that led to an eruptive return of memory and a reawakening of history. The crumbling of national myths, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, made a new confrontations with questions of guilt and responsibility necess necessary. And that not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but particularly also in Western Europe. And this included also a new element, which was the Holocaust. The Holocaust had not played any role for early European integration, and it was certainly not considered a point of reference. Uh, res uh, reference. And this silence is very similar to what happened on the national level. So the interpretation of the Holocaust as a founding act is really only plausible from an ex post perspective. And it has to be understood in a certain context, namely the attempt to, in, to create an overarching political identity beyond the institutional framework of the European Union by adding a transnational layer to national identities and memories. Now, the European Union debate in this context is, of course, part of a much larger debate 
that takes place transatlantically um, and uh, includes many countries that are not part um, of the European Union. Now, Anna already mentioned that there was a, a flurry of activities that started in the 1990s on the institutional level um, with the aim to anchor this memory firmly to the institutional setting. So the European Parliament passed several resolutions that were specifically addressing what were turned the murder of the European Jews. And this was happening in the 1990s, so before the Central and Eastern European countries um, joined. The European um, resolution, uh, European Parliament resolution in 1995 then also declared the 27th of January as a European wide day to commemorate the Holocaust. And well, it's not only a European day, of course, but it's an international day uh, by now. If you uh, do a simple search in the Eurolex repository, um, then you can see that the Holocaust has occupied more space in EU documents since the 1990s than most other events in European history. The Holocaust has become the yardstick with which many other political developments are being measured and evaluated. A nation's ability to face up to its national past has also become a soft entrance criterion for joining the EU. And we just heard about um, the Western Balkans when it comes to this. Um, it obviously, uh, this soft, soft uh, entrance criterion is not part of the official Archeo Communitaire, but it does play quite an important role. Um, obviously uh, became one of the linchpins for the most recent debates on memory politics on the European level um, because it had profound implications for the accession of the Central and Eastern European states in 2004. Um, so Anna called it memory wars. I uh, used the term divided memory <laughs> to be a little bit um, yeah, less drastic here. Um, but what is certainly true is that from the very first sitting of the European Parliament, and many of the newly admitted EU member states challenged the very Western European representation of World War II and the Holocaust. For them, of course, the end of Second World War had not meant the beginning, uh, the, uh, the, had not meant um, a liberation, but the beginning of a new period of repression by the Soviet Union. And this newer experience of communist dictatorship had superseded um, in many ways the memory of what had happened before. In this context, the requirement to accept the EU endorsed narrative as part of the accession process was really perceived as an imposition. MEPs from the new Western, uh, new member states questioned the Western interpretation of history and used the European Parliament as a platform to put forward an alternative memory narrative according to which the experience of suffering under Nazism and Stalinism are comparable and should therefore also receive equal recognition. In the minds of many Western MEPs, um, this was uh, coming close to a falsification of history and was therefore met with fierce resistance. And the moment then the representatives of several Central and Eastern European countries proposed to introduce a day of remembrance for the victims of communism in the European Remembrance Calendar um, was when um, the differences between the consolidated Western narrative and the Eastern request for recognition of their experiences erupted in open parliamentary debate. Um, reading those debates is maybe one of the most interesting um, European documents that you, that you can read. So if anyone is interested in reading parliamentary debates, and I can only recommend those ones, um, it tells you a lot about um, yeah, the, the, the kind of um, discussions that are going on in the European level. Um, if we now look at the more recent incidents of memory clashes, also in the context of the Ukraine war, for example, it becomes clear that memory and remembrance continue to be used as political tools to underline difference or to legitimize, legitimize political action or inaction, uh, as we've seen also again in the Ukraine context. So the impression of a tension and conflict-free European memory policy, um, as might be suggested by the resolutions of the European Parliament, um, is certainly deceptive in this context. Um, this does not mean, though, that EU memory politics are ineffective because of the inherent impossibility to create a conflict-free policy. Um, indeed, if we look more closely at the initiatives, especially of the European Commission, um, then we can see that debate and conflict are actually welcomed by the institutions. And why is that? Well, simply because um, conflict, memory conflicts, are seen as elements that can contribute to the formation of a European public sphere. That sounds a bit like a contradiction, but I will explain in a second uh, what it means. 
Um, so the most emblematic memory initiative by the European um, Commission is the Europe for Citizens program. It's not called Europe for Citizens program anymore, um, but this was um, the, the yeah how it was called at, in, at its inception um, in December 2006. And it was really this belief that an open memory culture thrives only with citizens' engagement um, that uh, yeah makes the European Commission um, uh, finance uh, this particular project with the aim to mobilize grassroots action by research institutes, museums, human rights organizations, and civil society or, uh, associations. So it was really through the promotion of citizens' initiatives and therefore targeting a level that lies below the official state level. And I think that is interesting yeah? because we just heard that um, Anna was rightly saying um, that um, nation states still have ownership over the past and the way the past is dealt with. So here we the, the commission is kind of jumping the national level um, and is looking at uh, the local level. So we can discuss that later, I think, because that's a, that's a very interesting um, a way of, of dealing with um, these memory issues. So it is through the promotion of citizens initiatives that the civil understanding of history is being aimed at um, that allows for an active exchange between different memory cultures. Now, if you look more closely, um, this is a great idea, of course, but um, what stands in uh, stark contrast to it is the amount of funding that's actually available. Um, so in considering the importance that has been attached by European policymakers to memory and identity issues in the past years, then the discrepancy between aims and financial means remains striking. To conclude, because I think uh, I'm running out of time here, is that in a recent sense, I think we can say that EU uh, policies seem to closely adhere to the considerations of scholars who have postulated the idea that there is no such thing as a collective memory, but that there can well be collective conditions for memories. Um, I think the attempts of the Commission to support initiatives that aim at creating a democratic culture of discussion needs to be understood in this context. But there's also deeper lying reasons. Um, memory conflicts uh, are seen as damaging for the integration project. Um, and the, the importance of remembering the past um, is uh, clearly linked in both uh, the European Parliament resolution and European Commission initiatives um, to what's perceived as threats to the current state of democracy and the basic values lying at the heart of European integration. And you can see that especially in the very recent resolutions on memory um, that were passed uh, by the European Parliament, where this link is very clearly uh, made between yeah, threats to also to the future again. Um, so in a way, uh, the future comes back there. Threats um, to, the, to democracy in the future and the necessity um, to remember the past. The way in which the European Union tries to connect past, present and future says certainly a lot about the self-image it wants to convey and the vision it wishes to foster among its citizens. Equally telling, though, is also what is being overlooked, and that's the memory of colonialism and imperialism. So the EU has remained curiously quiet about both, despite the fact that the history of colonialism is intrinsically linked to the history of European integration. By concentrating its remembrance efforts for decades almost exclusively on the experience of Nazism, fascism and National Socialism and Stalinism, it has excluded the memory of Europeans as perpetrators of colonial crimes from a shared past. I think it remains to be seen how the European Union will deal with those evident gaps in its remembrance landscape in the future. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, so now, uh, uh, next we'll hear from Irena Ristic from the Institute of Social Sciences in Belgrade, Serbia. And um, um, so the title of her presentation is The Interplay of Nationalism and Europeanization in the Western Balkans. And then we will have uh, a Q&A session. Uh, Irena, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jana, and uh, thanks for the invitation to this webinar. I was <clears throat> already enjoying listening to the previous speakers. Um, let me share my... You are... I guess seeing the screen, no? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, I see that I will be somehow uh, a bit uh, the, um, yeah, a bit out of the field from the previous speakers. So uh, with the focus on uh, more this constitutional or legal aspects, uh, 
<clears throat> I wanted to uh, talk a bit about uh, how nationalism uh, changed, uh, or let's say, uh, what is considered nationalism and national identity that these uh, terms somehow also over time, over the last three decades now have changed and uh, in their, uh, uh, how they are perceived and uh, their power, uh, how it was uh, perceived, uh, not only within the countries that were joining the EU, but also in the EU itself. Mainly, uh, I wanted to, of course, yeah, just uh, as as usual to see what what are the what kind of nationalism I'm talking here about to narrow it down a bit and um, and then what uh, what is European Europeanization as we know and as we already heard it has so many aspects and um, um, here I will basically under Europeanization uh, when I refer to it in this presentation, it mainly means the EU integration of uh, not only the Western Balkans, but mainly, yes, uh, the, the examples will come from there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, you will see that it, it can also be applied very easily to, to other candidate uh, states that are not, uh, although there are not many left outside the Western Balkans. Um, when I talk about nationalism, this is even harder to to define or to nail down. Uh, there is a it's a whole discipline uh, that developed over the last three decades dealing with nationalism, the causes of nationalism, especially also for this region. Um, what uh, maybe uh, scholars uh, who are not familiar with it, or legal scholars, or uh, uh, other from other fields. Uh, what they know, of course, is, is uh, maybe this discussion of good and bad nationalism uh, that will, in fact, uh, can be uh, seen, uh, reflected in uh, the, the policy of the European Union or in the understanding of the European Union and not only of the, of the European Union, but also in the mind, uh, in as, as some main narratives that we can grasp uh, among European nations, uh, so all these states that were already in the European Union before 89. Um, in this sense, uh, we also talk about nationalism as being inclusive uh, or as being exclusive. Uh, and uh, you, of course, uh, can even if you're not familiar with these the uh, terms uh, and the concepts behind you can already conclude that uh, the inclusive nationalism has rather a positive uh, uh, connotation, while the exclusive one uh, is always seen as an obstacle for some uh, progressive uh, um, steps or some yeah some uh, progression uh, towards the EU. Uh, another uh, distinction is this ethnic and civic nationalism. This is also very relevant for the Western uh, uh, Balkans. Uh, for the countries from the Western Balkans, uh, given that uh, it is taken for granted that there the nationalism is more ethnically based, uh, while in uh, uh, the Western uh, Western European states, contrary to East and Central and Southeast Europe, the state that this nationalism is based on a civic um principle so the nation as such is uh, not based on uh, ethnicity uh, but on being the citizen of uh, of one state uh, france being the one of the most popular examples of this uh, but also of course great britain uh, although great britain now not being anymore such a topic for um, given that it uh, left and of course, this always uh, pending question is nationalism construct constructive or destructive? And also I will touch upon this a bit. Now, uh, to, uh, to say it in advance or to take it a bit uh, ahead and then go back rather, uh, I want to, the, the main point or that I'm, that I'm making is that uh, the perception of nationalism has uh, changed and also the perception of whether national identity as such is seen as something uh, um, 
something that is of a, rather of an advantage. Uh, when we look back in 1899, uh, the wave uh, when uh, communism uh, ended and when uh, when this wave of uh, unification uh, in Europe started, uh, one of the slogans uh, that I like to quote uh, comes from Estonia, where uh, they said the road to Europe is the road of national liberation and uh, where national identity was considered as compatible with the idea completely compatible with the idea of the EU. Uh, and it was also reflected uh, in an affirmative way. So uh, it was uh, seen as a contribution to the European diversity, uh, to all these national identities uh, that man many of them and even of the minorities within these states. Um, this, uh, this perspective uh, had uh, started to change uh, by the latest in 2004 with the first uh, when this first enlargement wave was uh, completed and especially in 2007 when Bulgaria and Romania also joined and uh, not only in regard to to these eastern and uh, central european countries but also due to some processes in western europe nationalism started to be used in fact as a tool to undermine the european concept as such so these are the origins there we already see the origins of brexit uh, we can recall, uh, I think, all of us, uh, how uh, the nationalistic narratives uh, exploded uh, when Greece uh, was in crisis, how the, the pattern of um, South Europe uh, or Southern European member states was very much uh, in the used uh, or yeah it was back in the arena and uh, the the discussions uh, about whether to help uh, Greece Italy and Spain and how to help them was very much also nationalistic both in these countries uh, and both uh, in in those states uh, in the leading states France and Germany above all um, so uh, we see that uh, nationalism was at, at that point already back. Now, when we have a look at uh, what what was so different uh, um, in the 90s uh, and what then changed, uh, and then later I will come to this why possible explanations why it's changed. We see that uh, the EU enlargement uh, in 2004 was. Uh, marked by uh, by let's say three major features and that was uh, a joint commitment uh, of both uh, the european union the old back then old states uh, and those who wanted to to join uh, there was a strong economic interest uh, of all these uh, of all uh, let's say participants uh, that wanted to join and those who wanted the uh, the enlargement and it was uh, uh, the national states were in a way undisputed uh, this all uh, i can now of course not go into all these details but uh, we can see that this first uh, that this as we call it the first wave of enlargement in that was then completed in 2007 was primarily driven uh, by an uh, was carried on uh, carried by an idea and uh, by an intellectual idea of a unified Europe and uh, a responsibility of uh, never again letting uh, Europe be divided. So it was seen as something like uh, as a complete uh, to complete something that was interrupted in uh, forty five. And uh, the national identity was, or nationalism uh, as such, uh, was not seen as, uh, in the sense of this constructive nationalism, was seen as something that will enrich uh, the European Union. Uh, 
Uh, when we look at uh, the Western Balkans and uh, how uh, nationalism changed, of course, nationalism there had a different um, different role. Uh, after eighty nine, it uh, showed its uh, ugly face or all this that uh, we usually um, uh, link to uh, destructive uh, or bad nationalism. Um, however, uh, we also see that the European Union, of course, changed uh, due to internal problems that were completely unrelated to the Western Balkans. Uh, it's changed, or let's say the momentum uh, was gone in 2008 after uh, other uh, events that uh, went. We see that uh, the idea uh, uh, that was uh, pushed uh, by intellectual elites in Europe uh, has passed. And uh, this, uh, what, uh, what could be considered a wind of change from 89 uh, was gone. And uh, there was not so much anymore uh, the, convic uh, the, the convention, uh, conviction of, of elites in the European Union that the enlargement is, uh, is uh, a priority. Uh, apart from that, uh, being faced with own uh, by by being faced by by own nationalistic um, movements that started to to gain power, uh, the uh, the elites uh, started to more to to uh, yeah, the the notion. Uh, of uh, responsibility uh, towards a united Europe was not prevailing anymore. And uh, instead of saying never again a divided Europe, uh, we had more the notion of never again the same mistake like 2007. So never again uh, taking uh, new members that are maybe not ready uh, just out of the uh, the idealistic idea that Europe uh, should be united. Also, uh, Cyprus was taken as an example of uh, never again, uh, that was applied also for the Western Balkans very much, never again taking uh, a country uh, that has um, disputed uh, conflicts uh, based on national identity and on two nations. So the, the, the experience seemed rather uh, not uh, not good. Now, uh, when we uh, see what, how, how did uh, nationalism uh, became an excuse for an enlargement uh, uh, stop or uh, the enlargement fatigue? Of course, it cannot be reduced uh, the, the fact that this Europeanization uh, of the Western Balkans uh, is not moving on, cannot be explained uh, only to nationalism. Nationalism is just one of the bricks in the whole uh, in the whole wall, and uh, but uh, it uh, it can serve as an explanation uh, that uh, given the destructive power that nationalism can have also on economic development. Uh, we can uh, observe that uh, nationalism uh, is starting to be uh, mutually <laughs> reinforced uh, by both the European Union and the Western uh, Balkan states. So when we, for example, as case studies, and I will, of course, also just briefly run uh, through them as, as examples, if we take Macedonia, uh, where we uh, where we had an enlargement uh, stop or uh, or the impossibility of uh, Macedonia to even open negotiations due to an um, due to to an uh, conflict or a dispute uh, with Greece which already was a EU so we can and was in a way also supported by the EU uh, we see that uh, Ma Macedonia for uh, 20 years, basically, or 15 years, was blocked uh, due to a very nationalistic <laughs> and one could even say uh, quite trivial uh, name dispute over a region. Eventually, Macedonia accepted 
uh, and the, the government that accepted it uh, took a uh, took a big risk uh, to do so to accept uh, the name uh, to change the name of its country and even the name of of the own national identity in order to open up negotiations just uh, to one one year later be confronted with another uh, ultimatum again by the another member of the European Union now Bulgaria again a very nationalistic uh, in the sense of uh, in insisting on uh, on uh, some uh, uh, issues related to national identity and again the European Union was not uh, willing to uh, to uh, negotiate <laughs> A different solution, but let this weaker state, which candidate states usually are, uh, fight uh, this <laughs> this battle uh, with uh, knowing that it is basically uh, a lost battle uh, if Macedonia is not simply does not accept everything that is asked uh, from uh, Bulgaria. Uh, the same uh, thing, or uh, very similar, when we see nationalism being uh, used, uh, is in the Serbian Kosovo dispute, where uh, we see that uh, this conflict uh, is for a long time now just an open space for nationalists on both sides to play the, uh, to use these uh, conflicts as uh, to to mobilize, uh, mostly before elections, but then also to simply mobilize and distract from other uh, issues. Uh, the Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic, uh, is uh, more than a good example of how uh, some disputes that are in which the European Union is also involved can be endlessly used to uh, stay in the loop and uh, play a very populistic uh, um, uh, game uh, based on, of course, nationalism. And uh, finally, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, what we already heard today, but uh, we see that the nationalism uh, is in a very uh, strange way woven into the constitution uh, and at the same time uh, the nations there, the people there are expected to act against it, which uh, would mean they, they whenever somebody uh, in Bosnia, uh, there are even legal cases, acted against or challenged the constitution, uh, and they may even succeed it in some of the cases, it got clear that they have uh, the implementation of such, such de decisions always ends up uh, um, unsuccessfully. Uh, so uh, the the signal that was sent uh, was always uh, you have to overcome your nationalism in order to join the club. Uh, on the other side, the European Union, as such, is also uh, having the having a role of uh, pushing <laughs> this nationalism not only with the policy that I just briefly described over this region, uh, but also with own uh, policies that are, as I also already said, independent of, of the Western Balkan region. Brexit is, of course, the best example of it. We can all uh, remember the narratives that were used and the whole debate uh, that was uh, very much uh, Compatible, uh, com, uh, com, yeah, it, you could really compare it uh, quite a bit uh, with uh, all these uh, slogans and um, and narratives that were used uh, when Yugoslavia was falling apart, uh, and uh, it was striking to see how uh, very similar phrases were used also uh, during uh, Brexit. Um, of course, uh, as I mentioned already, Bulgaria and Greece, uh, this is also a nationalism that comes, in fact, from outside. And um, when we uh, look uh, on also those states that are main, maybe not uh, mainly, mainly involved, let's say Germany or France as main or even uh, Finland, 
uh, uh, more out outsiders, uh, not outsiders, but not uh, involved in the Western Balkans, uh, we see that uh, the nationalistic agenda uh, is uh, taking uh, taking uh, uh, a bigger uh, uh, having a bigger role, and uh, it is not only uh, to. It is not only used to to say that um, the European Union cannot deal with uh, nationalism, but it is also seen as uh, that they have a domestic crisis or internal crisis that is used um, uh, as an as an excuse uh, or not as an, the the enlargement stop is used as an excuse to fight an uh, inner uh, crisis of uh, rising uh, nationalism. Now, uh, when we put this now together, uh, what can we, uh, how can we explain it? Uh, well, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my point here is that nationalism that used to be always uh, um, uh, um, in a way, uh, put uh, or it was considered uh, a part of of uh, South uh, Eastern Europe or of of the Western Balkans as uh, something that they have to overcome. We see that nationalism is not by far something that is uh, existing only there, and that this is the main obstacle for uh, for uh, for their Europeanization. Um, and uh, of course, we see uh, a lack. What we had in 2004, this wave when in 2004 the countries that joined, they were also uh, they had a economic interest uh, uh, by the EU to to join the EU. This interest, of course, is uh, missing since uh, by the latest since the global economic crisis. And of course, this uh, lack of economic interest. Um, is causing also that uh, these countries uh, stay rather uh, behind. Uh, and uh, by staying behind, uh, they create also a fertile gra ground for nationalism. And uh, at the same time, uh, the, the nationalism within the EU is reinforcing this as well. So we have... Uh, uh, a bad combination of many nationalisms that are all uh, caused by different uh, by different uh, causes, and uh, but at the end they are mutually reinforcing uh, themselves. And yeah, as a as a conclusion, I mean, uh, what used to be nationalism used to be a strength, not nationalism, but the national diversity and uh, and the. Um, the the underlining of national differences within the EU used to be a strength uh, of the EU, uh, but now, in fact, uh, these uh, features, national features, they uh, turn into the main driving force for uh, inner blockade and inner uh, crisis, uh, and of course, they also have this spillover effect on other candidate countries. That was it. I hope I'm still in time um, and uh, maybe we can then uh, continue in uh, question with questions um, if there will be some. Thanks. Okay, Irina, thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting uh, and also very, very rich um, uh, presentation. Uh, I think that uh, we can have uh, uh, a brief Q&A session so that we can open a Q&A session. Uh, let me only uh, mention once again that uh, questions and comments uh, can be submitted uh, by using the Q&A uh, feature on Zoom. So um, I don't see uh, any question now. So maybe we can start uh, with uh, with uh, our speakers and see if they would like to add uh, something or also if they have some, some questions in relation to the presentations that we, we, we heard. 
yeah, if I may, because I really, <laughs> I was really running for my presentation because you didn't didn't yeah, set to me. I'm so sorry, we were on the, on the chat on the other side, so I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I just wanted to briefly touch upon the, the, the thing that I mentioned in the introduction of my presentation, but I haven't really engaged with. And this is the um, what I call the um, the result of the Europeanization of memory in the Western Balkans, uh, and I refer to it as memorial uncultured. So what actually happened? What is the current uh, status of memory politics in the Western Balkans? I think it's very, very interesting. And it's not only related to the, uh, let's say, direct effects of the Europeanization of memory and European integration, but it's also related to the fact that, um, that Okay, Nikki. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I apologize. Uh, it's also related to the fact um, of how the memory politics, how the the, the memorialization, let's say, has been used um, in this process of transitional justice since the 1990s. So since the 1990s, um, and when the the war started in Yugoslavia, and then with the establishment of this. Uh, uh, newly formed, let's say, uh, states in the Western Balkans, we have seen that the politics has heavily abused um, this dividing potential of uh, collective memory of the narratives of the Second World War and uh, the, the war in the 1990s in the Western Balkans. And what we are seeing actually now that is actually um, there is no actually consensus, neither on the Second World War and neither on the events in the 1990s in the countries themselves and among the countries in, in the Western Balkans. And of course, this is uh, creating a big problem to uh, how to integrate this kind of divisive uh, memories into this European, uh, European memory framework. Because even now, when we talk about the Ukrainian war and we see the European institutions and the European Union representatives referring to Ukrainian war, uh, the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine as the first conflict after the Second World War in Europe, we also see that the, ba the Balkans, that memories of the 1990s, the, the wars in the 1990s, um, uh, in the dissolution of Yugoslavia and what, what unfolded afterwards, um, are not being part of this global European memory, European memory picture. And uh, retro uh, retroactively, if we think about how memory has been used by the European Union in the Western Balkans, we can see that this kind of like um, approach that the European Union had in the Balkans towards the past, this destructive past of the 1990s, was actually something uh, that traveled on two different roads. We have seen that there was this political attempt at pacifying the tensions and calming the conflict and resolving the conflict. And this um, insistence on building reconciliation, promoting peace, promoting uh, these guarantees of non-repetition. And this traveled on different tracks from what was going in the society itself, what was going uh, with the victims of the, uh, the conflict and the violence itself in the 1990s. When we have seen that the, the victims, um, actually uh, had uh, fought very, very hard to get their rights and needs uh, respected by their own member states, et cetera, et cetera. So this has produced this kind of uh, uh, use of memorialization, not only by the, the politics, but also by the practitioners and NGOs and international community as something that was a sort of a band-aid for what were really aches and problems of the population on the ground. So we have this kind of unhinged memorial culture that has become mem memorial unculture where memorialization is used for everything from uh, respecting um, uh, victims' rights to promoting, um, raising, uh, raising um, awareness on certain events to promoting uh, this kind of uh, victim, victimhood-related tourism, which is actually a big thing in the, in the Western Balkans. And um, I think that uh, also with regards, and I will stop here with regards to the transitional justice experts and practitioners, um, and their use of um, memory and memorialization um, initiatives in the Western Balkans, that they have often stranded actually into advocacy rather than 
uh, focusing on whether memorialization has any actual effect for the uh, populations, victimized populations in the Western Balkans. And hence, I think that we live in this kind of a trash memorial culture in the Western Balkans when memory means everything and means actually nothing because it's uh, really a, a trauma-driven collective memory whereby uh, there are no references on positive, let's say, elements of the past, of the history, the peace-promoting initiatives to stop the 1990s war. But this is not only the, uh, let's say, the quality of the, let's say, the Balkans memory politics, but also the European level, as Aline mentioned, um, there is a, a very selective approach to what actually European past is. She mentioned colonialism, but talking about more positive moments that are not trauma-driven uh, memory canons of the European Union, there is also uh, this kind of amnesia when it comes to um, the, the coal and steel community uh, where we had the first border movers, the first Eurostars who were actually immigrants from Turkey or Yugoslavia, from Morocco, who actually built the European Union, the blue collar workforce in the fifties. So all these kind of uh, elements are actually showing that uh, memory politics on European or either national level is rather, rather selective. And it's mainly driven by this kind of a, a trauma, a trauma, uh, traumatic, uh, let's say, uh, collective memory because it has a more mobilizing potential. So I think I'll, <laughs> I'll end up with my comment here. So thanks, Sana, for, 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 for adding this. Um, other comments, questions? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in what um, Anna was saying about uh, the Balkans not being part of the picture, because especially if we look at the Ukraine war, and uh, I mean, you mentioned this, um, you can clearly see uh, what kind of role the Balkans play in terms of um, yeah, another element of comparison, right? So if you look at not the, the recent war uh, starting um, uh, 2022, but um, already the, the first aggression in 2014 when Crimea was annexed, um, there was lots of references made um, to um, the Balkan Wars and um, the kind of mistakes that were made. Um, and uh, it was often used as some sort of, yeah, e example that should not be repeated if you so want. Um, and then if you look at the reactions by politicians, I'm thinking about Angela Merkel, etc., they always said, no, 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 no. We cannot compare this completely different situation. Uh, let's not do this. So kind of, um, yeah, I just want to underline what Anna was saying. It's like taking it completely out of this, this European narrative and making some sort of um, yeah, idea that, that this is this is different. Um, and I think that's why it's possible to say now this is the first war on European ground since 1945, because already then the, the Balkans were kind of cut out um, there. Uh, despite the fact that at the time people were talking about, well, a war in Europe's backyard, right? <laughs> so the whole question of uh, where the boundaries are, what belongs and what doesn't belong, um, ha has been there from the very beginning um, and is certainly uh, driving um, policy uh, decisions, especially foreign policy decisions up to date. So thanks for, 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 for the comment. Other questions or comments? Irena, would you like to add something? No, I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It is, I mean, what, what um, Anna and Aline said, I, I uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, the, it's, of course, a, uh, uh, um, yeah, I, it, there are so many it's so many layers of of these uh, discussions when it comes to uh, to memory and uh, there is basically uh, a war on on uh, on memories and uh, how to uh, yeah how to uh, in a way use them this this example of Ukraine I think this is somehow that always comes back as uh, as uh, some unconsciousness uh, from uh, from Europe uh, or from Western Europe, uh, in the sense of 
yeah, that that was the that was the backyard war. That was this mess down there, <laughs> because they were simply uh, there like this. Uh, but here we have something else, and uh, Russia, our enemy, um, attacking, uh, and it, it it is framed differently. Although when we when we look uh, on 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 um, the essence of of these two wars, then uh, we see, of course, nationalism again being a driving force. Also, <laughs> just of course. Uh, Serbian nationalism in Yugoslavia uh, has many similar features as Russian uh, nationalism in in Ukraine. Uh, only that Serbia, being small, uh, did not uh, was not able to create such a huge uh, response as uh, as uh, the aggression of uh, Russia on Ukraine. And I think this simply is a matter of uh, size that makes a difference. But underlining. Uh, we we see many parallels uh, in the in the use and misuse of uh, nationalism and memories uh, in in such conflicts and uh, I think uh, the this issue uh, that the Western Balkans have they uh, it is on a different scale uh, and simply uh, it is yeah it is simply not important enough. Uh, and uh, when we refer to this, uh, if we go on in political science, you have this uh, theory that uh, the European Union uh, is uh, in a way just, uh, it, it does not even care about nationalism in this region, region and whether they, the European Union is also contributing to it or not, but the only um, concern that the European Union has is to keep this region in a way uh, peaceful or uh, to 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 make sure there is absence of war and everything else is considered as uh, not a major um, challenge uh, from contrary to uh, to ukraine uh, and what can develop from there okay thank you very much so we have some other questions so uh, professor uh, from Pro professors halma in priban so you can uh, they will ask you some uh, additional questions. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, not being an expert on 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 the team of of this excellent panel, I really enjoyed uh, every presentation. So, my question is: uh, You were talking about uh, clashes of 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 memory, uh, and it was obvious that that uh, regarding the Holocaust, there was one one kind of clash uh, between mostly East Central Europe, the new member states and the old member states. So if we are talking about clash uh, regarding the Ukrainian war, so where, where are the boundaries here? Because it's, it's certainly not that simple as in the case of Holocaust. Uh, even East Central European countries are divided. So Hungary's approach is totally different uh, that of the the Polish approach. Uh, so what what is the the main main divisive factor here uh, regarding the Ukrainian war between different approaches? Can I say maybe something on the memory politics side of it? So they were, uh, well, as early, I think, as in the late 1990s, uh, there were first attempts at integrating the, the history of Ukraine into this European memory framework with the remembrance of the Holodomor. So there were resolutions passed by the European Parliament that actually sought to raise awareness on that event, which was the artificial famine in the 1930s um, caused by the, the Russians in, in, in Ukraine. And this has been promoted and, and uh, commemorated uh, at the European level. And when I say European level, I mainly, I mainly mean by the European institutions because as I said, soft laws, these kind of resolutions, memory resolutions, they are not legally binding. So the member states, they are not obliged to adopt a similar resolution in their own national governments. 
So on the European level, there, there was this kind of um, awareness raising on the, um, the history of Ukraine and uh, let's say um, showing the, the victimhood side of these totalitarian um, regimes that existed behind the Iron Curtain, including um, uh, the, the victims uh, in the 1930s. But um, there are many explanations actually to why this boom on the European level, when it comes to um, initiatives uh, from the Central Eastern European countries, why this boom came actually, and is um, related to the actually role of Russia. So many memory resolutions that were passed in the European pa Parliament, the main intended uh, recipient wasn't the European Parliament, wasn't the European Union, weren't the member states of the European Union, but the Russia. So if you read out through the resolutions made uh, and initiated from certain Central Eastern European member states, you will see that the ending paragraph, the European Parliament instructs uh, the government to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, adopt similar re resolutions to their national governments and also informs Russia and Duma, et cetera, et cetera, about this and instructs them to deal with the past. So um, there was this, uh, let's say, institutional or memory soft laws uh, backlash against Russia at the European level um, in 2000s after the enlargement in 2004 and 2000, uh, 2007, but without actual reference anymore to Ukraine. And Ukraine has become a political question only now, um, not the question of actually memory politics. I don't know if this partially re, uh, resp uh, responds, answers to your question, but this is the link actually that exists in memory laws uh, at, the, at the European level. Only this kind of link, I, 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 nothing comes on top of my mind that actually uh, concerns Ukraine. Alinda, you maybe uh, remember some other kind of resolution that relates to Ukraine and memory laws at the EU level? I think you've mentioned them. Um, I think what, what's interesting indeed, that's one of my, my new research projects is to look into the kind of legitimization strategies that I use when it comes to the Ukraine war, referring to memory by the different actors um, and the different countries. And I think like once then you can see the difference, right? Like what, what is being referred to and how is it being used as a mobilizing force um, for uh, those different policy decision um, uh, positions that, that we can observe in the European Union. Well, Radislav also mentioned um, the, um, the the Russian memory politics and the notion of historical truth, and which is also something that has been tackled by the European Parliament in some of the resolutions that concern uh, the Second World War and the role of Russia. But um, more than that, nothing comes on top of my mind specifically on Ukraine and, and, and memory workings at the European Parliament. Okay, we can take the second question now or comment. So, Professor Priban, if yeah. I put my uh, hand down but forgot to uh, uh, unmute. So, I completely agree with Gabo. This was fascinating. And uh, 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 what Ulat was talking about this abusive memory politics, this monstrosity of Russia. Uh, invading Ukraine under the label of denazification and what it cost in Europe yeah, that uh, uh, finally Germany realized that uh, this uh, uh, this is monstrosity that somebody uses the same techniques that their great grandfathers used during the Nazi times uh, uh, and uh, they label it as denazification. But my question is, uh, when does nationalism become patriotism? And patriotism as a positive force and patriotism as uh, uh, something which can shape political nation and uh, even uh, some democratic values, democratic uh, ideals. Is it war only or civil war or, and and again, yeah, I'm asking as an outsider, as somebody who wants to be illuminated here. Yeah, 
maybe I take it. <clears throat> well, uh, 89 nationalism, uh, the, 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 the collapse of the communist uh, system uh, triggered uh, and a creation of, uh, or uh, let's say, uh, flourishing of national identity that was uh, very much uh, yeah i it is also with this patriotic it is also a very contested term uh, but let's say it had a very uh, positive in effect on uh, what then uh, strengthened these states to to consolidate themselves based on on the nation uh, and in this sense uh, we have this recent uh, example uh, from from the 90s in Central and uh, Eastern Europe, except Yugoslavia. So uh, there we had uh, basically the uh, the same process. Uh, given that Yugoslavia uh, uh, was uh, was as it was, so it was a system within the uh, the communist uh, world. Uh, it had uh, rather this negative effect where nationalism exploded and uh, and uh, went let's say, a step too far. <laughs> and uh, these are, of course, I mean, now we cannot go into the reasons why it happened this way in Yugoslavia and not in Czechoslovakia, for example. Um, but uh, we, uh, in in the studies of nationalism, we see that this is, uh, that the, the, the strength of nationalism uh, went in these uh, two directions. But when we talk about theory, uh, there are many uh, Hobsbawm, Eric Hobsbawm, for example, he says that nations are, a, and nationalism is a precondition for a nation, okay? So when we talk about uh, rom this romantic nationalism in the 19th century, it had a quite positive connotation, you know, the German, the Italian reunification. Uh, it was all based on strong uh, national and patriotic, I mean, and also uh, in, in, in 1848, uh, all these revolutions that were carried out on these sentiments. So there is not uh, one, I think the, the context matters a lot of how uh, nationalism um, uh, will be uh, what what the role what will be the role of nationalism whether patriotic and let's say positive or rather destructive uh, and negative uh, and of course then we again have when we talk about create nation uh, nation creation uh, the creation of nations uh, when you look at at uh, at the theories. The main theories of uh, Gellner and Benedict Anderson and Hobsbawm, they are all based on uh, on the experiences of uh, of Western democracy of Western nations, and uh, we all uh, uh, and we all uh, tend sometimes to simply apply them on Eastern Europe, but it is not. Uh, it can all uh, often uh, be in a way uh, a mistake uh, that uh, that does not resolve. Uh, the 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 problem or the puzzle, uh, because uh, the conditions in Western uh, society, is starting from industrialization and uh, and the societies as such, having uh, having had aristocracies and so on, they were so much different from the developments in Eastern Europe that these models show their weaknesses when being applied on uh, on uh, Eastern Europe. This is not to say that these uh, the weaknesses are uh, yeah that they are given in these these theories are uh, very well and uh, and um, and sound for Western societies for Eastern societies uh, or Eastern European societies for example I am a great fan of Miroslav Kroch and his uh, his theories where he start where he tried to to develop a model that would be more uh, compatible with the history and the development of small states. Because when we talk about nations and nationalism, it makes a big difference if we talk about nationalism in a big state like Italy or Germany. And when we talk about a small state, be it even in Denmark, so be it even in Western. So these are all nuances that make a great difference. And uh, that, uh, yeah, so Kroc, for example, was very much uh, say in, in favor of saying uh, the 
Eastern European and small nations, they go through complete, not completely, but quite different phases in uh, in which nationalism and, and the sentiment of nationalism uh, plays a different role. Because uh, when we look also on Hab uh, Habsburg, uh, of the of the monarch, Habsburg monarchy, uh, the role that nationalism uh, had there, it is also, you know, you, we cannot say the, the Hungarian nationalism within the Habsburg monarchy was something else than the Croat nationalism or the Serbian nationalism. So these are all these uh, then uh, that these little differences that uh, yeah not not only where the devil is in, uh, but also um, that uh, makes it uh, a, a very um, interesting field for us researchers to dig in and to see. Uh, what are these differences and why can we not just talk about uh, Yugoslavia or Habsburg monarchy and say, yeah, this is all multicultural and uh, there, there are just many, many differences. And as I said, the context I think matters a lot. Okay, thanks, Irena. So we have uh, one another, one other, uh, another uh, round of questions. So uh, maybe we can do it uh, as before. So Professor Hamai, you can start and then Professor Priban, you can also. Uh, follow so follow with your question. Sorry for for uh, taking the floor again, but this is highly interesting. So le let me ask a follow up question. Uh, and it's maybe not only small small uh, states, but but big ones as well. So can can we consider the resistance against the federalization of Europe? For instance, the the attempt to to adopt a, a European constitution by the resistance by France or the Netherlands uh, as as a kind of nationalism, a good one maybe, or the same applies to to all the constitutional identity uh, arguments against the 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 joint uh, common European identity by the German constitutional court or by the Italian constitutional court, are those also signs of good nationalism? I would say yes, but I'm curious about hearing your opinion. Maybe can I jump in because it's 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 highly connected and uh, yeah, I, I really like what Gabor has just said. And uh, what era, since you mentioned Hroch, of course, there is a fascinating story uh, that happens in 1848. Um, the Congress, uh, all German Congress in Frankfurt invites Czech MPs to Frankfurt and Franciszek Palacki uh, basically says, no, thank you very much. We want the constitution. We know that we cannot survive. Um, if we join the Frankfurt. It is the end of uh, Czech language. It is the end of Czech history. Uh, the importance of constitutionalism in all this and what Gabor mentioned uh, in the European context is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that uh, constitu European constitution as a project of reconciling big and small nationalism. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you for this uh, interesting uh, input. Um, I uh, I have to say personally, I'm not. Uh, uh, I would not put it as good or bad, uh, as long uh, as there. Uh, for me, I think the uh, the what is behind this is much uh, more important. So, what is the driving force for this resistance to federalization? Is it to uh, simply uh, uh, control the the right wing uh, narratives in their own countries, and uh, uh, or is it that uh, in fact the vision of Europe uh, should not be like the like to give up the idea that there can be something like a United States of Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, we have these differences also within uh, countries. You, when you look uh, uh, after the Second World War, Bavaria uh, in Germany, it was a very 
un underdeveloped compared to other, I mean, relatively speaking. Um, but uh, the, the, the step that Bavaria made in these 50 years due to a strong uh, a state that was in a way, you know, uh, Bavaria was uh, taking a great advantage of the federal system and of, uh, sub, uh, of, of financial help <laughs> uh, and made the best out of it. So, of course, we have also other examples like Italy, uh, the north and the south, and, uh, and there it did not happen in the same way as it did in the north and the south of Germany. But um, the, I, I fear that uh, the resistance uh, for a federalization and the strong, a stronger federal, federalization of Europe uh, is that the reasons are more in this um, fear or in this uh, attempt to accommodate uh, nationalistic policies, then in the vision that they say, well, then Europe will collapse and then we will not have anything. Uh, so that it is a rather a short-sighted uh, policy. However, I think uh, at the same time that, of course, uh, 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 the, the idea that uh, uh, the Western Balkans, for example, if, to, in, 10 day, in 10 years Montenegro joins at that Montenegro or Serbia will have the same level as Denmark. It's also not, not realistic and I think uh, maybe it should not even be put as a target because uh, it might uh, end up as a frustrating, um, yeah, as something that will keep up uh, frustrations. But uh, the I, I, my impression is more that nationalism, that all these uh, resistance uh, towards that a vision, in fact, is lacking, and that vision that was there in the nineties uh, towards the European Union uh, was uh, more inclusive uh, than it is today. So that uh, the let's say the the wind that was blowing back then after eighty nine. The readiness uh, among the elites, but also among citizens of the European Union, was more to say being united uh, is more important than keeping up our uh, high level of um, of uh, yes of, uh, of standards. Uh, so uh, the readiness, this of course, this readiness uh, radically declined uh, among. Uh, among citizens and among elites, uh, and of course, let nationalism prevail. Okay, uh, Anna, would you like to add something? No, I'm I'm okay. Uh, Irena explained um, her position quite thoroughly. Okay, so I think that uh, we have to stop here because we are running out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank again all speakers for their amazing presentations and also for being with us uh, today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the Bye. invitation. Bye.